Hello and welcome to this special global news presentation. I'm Mercedes Stevenson. In just about half an hour, Prime Minister Trudeau will make his way to Rideau Hall and ask the Governor General, Mary Simon, to dissolve Parliament. And that means we will officially be in another federal election on the cusp of it this morning, just two years after the last one. But this election will be like unlike any other we've ever had. Canadian health experts, of course, are saying that we have entered a fourth wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. They're not yet certain how this wave will look or whether or not it could really lead to the return of restrictions. But the potential trickle down effect on voters and candidates is unclear. If the last 17 months have been any indication, one thing is certain. This election will not go down as others have in years past. And to help you navigate all of this and what to expect is our team of global news journalists from across the country getting you all the information and context that you need before you decide how to cast your vote. With me this morning at Conservative headquarters, Abigail Bimin. Thank you for joining us, Abigail, at the NDP. We have Mike Le Couture. He will be covering that campaign. And David Aiken. He's over at Rideau hall on the liberal beat and he'll be bringing us the latest this morning as we wait for the prime minister to walk across there to the governor generals and that's where we're actually going to start off with david david what are we expecting there at rito hall over the next couple of hours Right, so this is the routine we see whenever we launch a general election is the prime minister goes to the governor general and says, can you please dissolve the current parliament? So that'll be the request that the prime minister will make of uh, Governor General Mary Simon. She presumably will say yes. There may be a brief discussion and uh, that will be that. Be ready to, to draw up 338 writs drop the writs, as they say, for uh, the 44th general election. So that'll probably take a few minutes, that discussion between the Governor General and the Prime Minister. And then the Prime Minister, now the Liberal leader, will come out and the podium set up behind me, and he'll deliver a uh, press conference today. And then uh, you will shortly hear all the leaders react to the call to this election. And Mercedes, you've already heard some previews. Uh, Jug Jugmeet Singh, the NDP leader, is uh, headlining this as Justin Trudeau's selfish election. The uh, Conservatives, uh, Aaron O'Toole's Conservatives, have been blitzing our emails all morning uh, with all sorts of statements the Prime Minister himself made saying we don't want an election during a pandemic. But Mercedes, as you know, we've had pandemic elections in B.C., Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Labrador. We've got one going on right now in Nova Scotia. And in those four that completed, the incumbent one in B.C., uh, John Horgan, the, the Premier, was criticized for calling an unnecessary election and he turned his minority into a majority. The incumbent one in Saskatchewan, Blaine Higgs, turned his minority into a majority in New Brunswick. So there is going to be a lot of talk about an unnecessary pandemic election. But at the end of the day, what we've seen so far is voters adjust and it doesn't seem to have harmed any incumbent in any of those provinces. Well, it's just that question that you touched on there, David, that it really hasn't seemed to harm the incumbents. And while people are kind of exasperated, including, by the way, senior liberals who I've talked to who are not thrilled about this idea either. <laughs> so people at home are wondering, why now? What's the liberal strategy with pulling the trigger in the middle of August? Well, and that is almost certainly going to be, if the prime minister doesn't address it, if Justin Trudeau doesn't address it in his remarks, he's going to get that question from journalists here. The, the bigger picture for most minority governments is they usually last a couple of years. And remember, the last election was 2019. We're almost a couple of years in. So historically, it's about the time that a minority prime minister is looking around for the right opportunity to win his majority. And certainly that is what the liberals have been doing for the last six months or so waiting and hoping that the pandemic situation improves. They have been leading in just about every poll for the last year and a half. The question is, are they leading enough right now to make this the moment to make their pitch for majority? I know we're gonna be talking to our friend Daryl Bricker of Ipsos about this in a bit, but I think if you take a look at his polls and, and, a, and a lot of other pollsters work, there's a lead there for the Liberals but it's not a slam dunk to get that majority. And what we're going to see, I think, in this campaign is Ontario and Quebec, there doesn't seem to be a lot of movement. There doesn't seem to be a lot of ability or places that the Liberals can pick up seats at anybody's expense in those two big provinces. But there is a lot of volatility in Western Canada. And I think this is going to be really interesting for the West 
uh, if, as, as, as historical elections go, Ontario and Quebec may not matter as much as B.C., certainly, maybe even Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. So why now? Because the Liberals think now is the right time to turn the minority into a majority. And we've got 36 days or so uh, when we'll find out if they're right or not. David, Team Trudeau has been testing the waters for some time now. What do you think we're going to hear in terms of key campaign messages from the Liberal leader, Justin Trudeau, today? And, and he's been asked that question. What is the ballot question going to be? And he really hasn't had much of a satisfactory answer. At one point he was talking about, well, uh, his uh, government's legislation is being held up in the Senate. Of course, an election's not going to change the Senate. They're all unelected there. Um, there was a trio of new ads debuted by the Liberal Party yesterday. These are video ads. You can see them on YouTube. They'll be running on social media and on television, of course. And really the theme there was, you know, um, we've got through this pandemic together now. Let's sit together and build back better, strong recovery. We're the ones to do it. It's pretty vague. It's nothing you can really hang your hat on, but I suppose it's that's really what the, the ballot question is going to be for uh, for Trudeau. For voters, I mean, one of the things we've seen from these other pandemic elections in the provinces, if you think, as a voter, how am I going to experience this federal election? It's going to be very, very different. Again, voters in BC and Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, etc., have gone through this. The first thing is, you're probably going to vote by mail-in ballot. And that means campaigns are almost immediately going to be contacting the supporters saying, here's how you get the mail-in ballot. And here's how you do it. You go to elections.ca, that's the Elections Canada website, and you fill in an application. That's the first thing. But then when it comes to the ballot question, because we won't be seeing mass rallies, for example, Justin Trudeau normally goes to the Montreal Pride Parade. It's happening today. He's not going there today just because it doesn't seem to be a very safe environment to be in a bunch of crowds. So Trudeau will not be doing, and none of the leaders will be doing all these mass rallies. What they will be doing is you're going to get a personalized campaign, if you will, on your device, on your, on your tablet. Digital media, as we've seen in all these campaigns, is going to play a really big role. And that means if you are a retired senior citizen, you're going to get different stuff pushed at you than if you're a young student, than if you're a family looking to buy their first home, which is kind of interesting in a democracy. We won't have that commons here because everybody's campaign will be personalized thanks to the digital media revolution and every campaign has been looking around at how all the provincial campaigns did it and they're ready to basically use your smartphone as the entree uh, to try to persuade you to get their vote. So this is going to be a very interesting campaign from the voters perspective. Interesting for us to try to cover because there's going to be different pitches coming to different groups of people in different parts of the country. Uh, David, before we turn to our other correspondents, I did want to touch uh, on a major breaking international news issue for you. Of course, Afghanistan is on the brink of falling to the Taliban. Bagram Air Base and the main prison have been taken now. Kabul is expected to fall in a matter of hours to the Taliban. Americans are evacuating the last of their staff and will shut their embassy on Tuesday. And as you know, Global News has learned this morning that 100 Gurkhas who were working for the Canadian embassy have been left behind. They were not evacuated. They are not on the list of Canadians uh, who work at the embassy or Afghan staff uh, who work at the embassy who are being evacuated this morning. I'm hearing from some diplomats who are questioning the timing of this election when you have this kind of a massive international conflict. Of course, we're also uh, have been able to report here at Global News that Canada is shutting the embassy. We reported that um, a few days ago here at Global News. David, does the impact of what's happening in Afghanistan and questions for the government. Uh, and by the way, they did announce that they will be taking 20,000 Afghan refugees from key vulnerable groups. Does that play into the election? Is that something that we're all watching and, and horrified by what's happening in Afghanistan? But is it on the voter calculus? Yeah, I, I think I think obviously voters, Canadians are watching uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. And I'm, I know you, Mercedes, uh, and I, we can't believe the speed at which uh, the Taliban have sort of resumed control. But as a political issue, uh, certainly the actual war in Afghanistan had nothing to do with Justin Trudeau government. It was Jean Chrétien's, Bill Graham's war. They started, it really took Canadian troops in there first. And Stephen Harper was there while, while most of the time he was there. If there is a political issue, I think you touched on it, uh, that the Trudeau government has taken some criticism 
system for perhaps not acting quickly enough to get Afghan interpreters out, Afghan refugees, those Afghans who help Canadians and may now be at risk from the Taliban. So that is an issue about the speed at which the Trudeau government responded to pleas from Afghans in country, knowing that the Taliban will be looking for them. And we may expect to hear the Prime Minister touch on that at some point during the day today. Thank you, David. We'll be checking back with you in just a little while. Let's head over now, though, uh, into Conservative headquarters where we have Abigail Beeman. She will be covering the O'Toole campaign once Parliament is dissolved. Erin O'Toole, of course, the leader of the Conservative Party. Some inside say there are concerns about his ability to perform in his first election of leader. Abigail, what are you hearing from the Conservatives about how they are planning to kick this off? I mean, obviously, Obviously, things didn't really go as planned under Andrew Scheer. There have been tangible changes with O'Toole at the helm, but it seems like there is trouble already in the messaging. That Twitter video that came out that's being heavily criticized that put Justin Trudeau's face uh, on a Charlie in the Chocolate Factory little girl running around. Um, not an auspicious start. What are you hearing from your Tory sources? That's right. Not an auspicious start. I think we, we have that video uh, to, to share with you if we just want to take a listen to that to, to bring viewers up to speed. Here we go again. Daddy will get you a golden goose as soon as we get home. No, I want one of those. I want a party with roomfuls of laughter. 10,000 tons of ice cream. So this was a video released on Twitter uh, talking about why Justin Trudeau would be calling this uh, election and just for the sole purpose of wanting a majority. But you saw uh, frustration sort of boil over with a number of members of the Conservative caucus taking to Twitter to decry this, calling it uh, embarrassing. It doesn't set the right tone to show that this is a party that's serious about leading the country. And then you saw a new video uh, from the Conservatives that I believe we have as well, sort of a, a more, let's say, mature adult approach to this question of why the election is being called now for the sole purpose of, of uh, Justin Trudeau uh, wanting a majority. But certainly trouble right out of the gates, It's I think, as you put it, to have uh, some, some more senior members of caucus publicly criticizing the tone or the messaging of the campaign before the campaign has even started. Uh, definitely not a good look. One of the challenges that Aaron O'Toole is going to have to deal with is, is establishing his own branding. It's been tough in a pandemic for any leader to be able to actually get out um, and get people to know them because you can't go and have events and, and know people. And one of the things that I've heard, Abigail, um, from a lot of conservatives is that they're worried that he's basically going to get branded with the same things as Andrew Scheer, even though there have been some substantial policy shifts, which we're going to talk about, including things like where they're at on the carbon tax. Uh, Aaron O'Toole, the first conservative leader to come out and say that he's pro-choice. When it comes to the actual campaign, um, how are they going to try to differentiate O'Toole and how important is that? Well, it's incredibly important in terms of the goal of bringing more people into the party, of convincing more Canadians that this is not uh, the, the party of Andrew Scheer, that there's been a, you know, a real change here and that they are a more progressive party uh, that, that can serve the needs of, of more people. So that will be critical. But as you say, a, a real challenge to see whether that can be done. Uh, we have seen uh, Aaron O'Toole out across the country in the past couple of weeks making a number of announcements, but, you know, didn't gather a lot of steam so far. And before that, while the other party leaders were out campaigning, it was really quiet on the O'Toole front for the beginning of summer. So certainly, you know, a challenge ahead. There are some policy differences. You mentioned the carbon tax. There are, you know, a lot of people who are pleased to hear Conservatives talking about that. There's also a lot of turmoil around that too. And we can talk about uh, when, you know, the party voted against a resolution saying that climate change is real uh, at their convention earlier. So certainly that will be a tough one uh, to unpack. And and we'll see how well uh, he's able to sell that with voters. There, there are other things uh, that Aaron O'Toole has been talking about, you know, different from his predecessors. There's been a focus on mental health and addictions. But we'll really have to see what's in this uh, campaign platform when that platform comes out uh, to see really how different uh, O'Toole is. He talks a lot about the need to be different, about the need for change. But we haven't seen anything, you know, really huge that sets him apart just yet. And I guess that's what the campaign is all about. Abigail, I wanted to ask you what the tone is like there at Conservative headquarters. Obviously a little hard to tell since this is not 
normal election where you have people all buzzing and cheering. You can't have them in the room. What's it like at headquarters right now with this pandemic launch? Well, at the moment, you could hear a pin drop. I'm the only person speaking in the room right now. Definitely very unusual for a campaign launch. There's a few of us reporters uh, doing some hits here, and there's some uh, staff uh, ready to go to have the to, to have the studio set up for, for when the, the conservative leader comes out. But it's very quiet. It's nothing like, uh, you know, the, the vibe that you get, obviously, when you have hundreds or thousands of people at a, at a launch, at a rally, ready to go. Uh, the conservatives are launching their campaign from here. Here from this downtown Ottawa uh, hotel and then there will be a t- not one but two virtual town halls later today uh, that O'Toole will lead uh, for Quebec and then later for British Columbia so we'll see how those go but uh, definitely a very quiet feel there's no there's no real sense of excitement I would say when you're standing in a big empty room compared to you know signs and thousands of people cheering and we'll we'll see this is you know a, a campaign like like no other with the pandemic we'll see how that changes as, as the days go on. And and to that point, Abigail, we've been hearing that it's likely the Conservatives won't be on the road seven days a week, that they are going to actually be using some other tactics to try to connect with voters. What does that look like? That looks like a lot more virtual events, uh, a lot of different ways to use virtual tools to, to connect with people. I, I think the Conservatives believe that there's an argument that perhaps it's easier to get voters who are maybe on the fence or maybe uh, curious about the Conservative Party, how different it is. Maybe it's easier to get those people to join a Zoom than it would be to have them come out to a rally, you know, pandemic or, or no pandemic. So definitely a different tactic here driven by uh, the pandemic. But the Conservatives are very concerned about uh, what a campaign would look like or a physical campaign would look like if cases continue to rise, if uh, COVID-19, you know, hospitalizations increase. There is a real fear here uh, that that could drastically change how this campaign unfolds, obviously for everyone. uh, But the Conservatives have been preparing for that with this studio that they've set up here uh, at this Ottawa hotel for months now, uh, ready to go with this different kind of campaign. But how that rolls out and whether that will really uh, attract voters uh, remains to be seen. Thank you, Abigail. We will talk to you again soon. Let's head over to the NDP now. The NDP lost a lot of seats the last time around. Leader Jagmeet Singh says that the party had an influence, though, on policy and programs with the liberal minority government when it came to pandemic spending. So what would constitute a win for the NDP this time around? And will this be a very different campaign? Let's bring in Mike LeCouture to field that next question. Hey, Mike, Singh has one campaign under his belt. Uh, Wasn't a great one for the NDP, but hearing they might be hoping for better success this time. What's the bar? What do they need to achieve? Yeah, right now, one source has told me that they're looking to gain between six and 12 seats. They think that that is well within reach possibly more. There is hope as they start the campaign here in Montreal that they can actually add to their seat total in Montreal, in Quebec. Right now they have just one MP on the island, Alexandre Boulouris. They're hoping for another gain. They are bringing back Eve Pelcle. Uh, she was formerly an MP uh, on the eastern tip of the island. She's going to be running in Outremont. That's Thomas Mulcair's old riding. Uh, and if people will remember, the old saying with the NDPs uh, in Montreal was, it's more care and a prayer. Well, they're hoping that that prayer comes through in uh, Pelcle and that she possibly takes Outremont and that, that that might also gain a bit of momentum. Uh, and so things will look extremely different uh, as opposed to the Prime Minister, uh, which uh, uh, David Aiken had said will not be going to Pride Parade. Uh, Jagmeet Singh will be going to Pride Parade right after the writ drops and right after he gives his press conference and his remarks here today. He will be going to Pride Parade and marching there. Uh, that is something that was already on the schedule, something that they were not going to change. Uh, And really, uh, the difference in this campaign couldn't be more stark, Mercedes. The last campaign that I started with the NDP uh, back in 2019, it was a bus tour of the GTA in the first week and a half, if not two weeks. Uh, This week alone, uh, they do have a plane for Jagmeet Singh, and they are going, they're starting here in Montreal, they're going to Toronto, then lower mainland BC for a couple of days. Then we're hearing we could be hitting Edmonton, Saskatoon, possibly even Regina. 
all in one week. And that did not happen in the last campaign, at least until week two, if not week three of the campaign. So it's very different. One NDP source telling me that their budget has doubled since 2019. So they are ready for this and they're hoping to make gains across the country, specifically in BC, uh, but they are signaling that there could be gains in other places, in other key pockets across the country. Mike, you're right. It's such a difference from the 2019 campaign. Uh, you and I were both out with the NDP at times. It, it was a real struggle for them, and they, they had to campaign in very small areas. They were, according to one source I spoke to, basically just trying not to lose official party status. Uh, so that was the goal. This time, they could potentially take a, a whack of Liberal support. That said, they have yet to crack 20% in the polls in terms of voter intention. That's a far cry from their 30% they had back in that orange wave that you and I were both here for under Jack Layton in 2011 when the NDP made history and became the official opposition. You talked a little bit about some of the targeting, but what do you think some of the policies are going to be in terms of the NDP trying to break through and get voters to choose them? Yeah, and it's interesting. As you said, back in 2019, it was really the Save the Furniture campaign. And this time they're talking about adding seats around the table in the form of MPs for the House of Commons. Uh, but what they're going to be looking at is trying to get to those pocketbook issues, trying to make sure that they continue to hammer home the point that while the Liberals uh, were bringing to the table certain policies during the pandemic, that it was the NDP that was fighting to actually get better benefits for people, the CERB and also the CRB, and pointing to the fact that uh, it was the NDP negotiation that helped to boost the wage subsidy program as well that the Liberals had first introduced. So they're hoping to sort of say to Canadians, look, uh, this is what we did with 24 MPs. Now imagine what we can do with even more in the House of Commons. It will be a tough, uh, a tough road to go, though, when you consider that they do only have 24 MPs. Going from fourth place to first may be uh, completely unattainable here, uh, but they're still going to try. And when you consider the reach that Jagmeet Singh has and, and what they're going to be trying to do, a mix uh, as all campaigns is going to be a virtual and in-person events, uh, keeping those in-person events small depending on where they are across the country in the different provinces following all the health guidelines. Uh, but Jagmeet Singh's online reach uh, is pretty incredible. You figure he has over 700,000 TikTok, uh, TikTok subscribers, uh, that alone reaches that youth vote, that key youth vote that both the Liberals and the NDP will be fighting for. Uh, and whether or not Jagmeet Singh can turn that into any kind of uh, actual votes will be something to be seen. Uh, the NDP is also telling us that they think that the mail-in ballots could benefit them because they see the youth vote as one um, th that wants to vote almost at any time of the day or any time during the campaign as opposed to having an actual election day. So they think that the mail-in ballots could help them. They're going to be tracking them, making sure that they get their people not only to get the mail-in ballot, but then to actually go and mail it uh, so that it does count. Uh, and that's how they figure that they might be able to try and gain some seats in this election. But again, it will be a completely different campaign uh, and one that we did not see in 2019, where you will be seeing a lot more of Jagmeet Singh around the country. How is the NDP feeling, Mike, in terms of the timing of this election? Yeah, I mean, Jagmeet Singh for the last couple of weeks have said, has said this is not the time for an election. And in fact, he had that minor campaign and wrote that letter to uh, Governor General Mary Simon saying you don't have to say yes to the Prime Minister to z dissolve Parliament. Uh, they really don't think that this is the time. Contrast that with the fact that he's been on a bit of a pre-campaign tour uh, and actually in unveiled the blueprint to his platform uh, just last week. And it certainly sounds like he's ready for a campaign, doesn't it? Uh, and the fact that he is going around and having these mini rallies, introducing candidates and the sort. Uh, so that is something that I think is a bit of a contrast and a question that he also has to answer in all of this. Uh, but again, he says this is the time to get back to Parliament, to have MPs back in the House and to continue to work for Canadians, continue to make sure that programs are going out the door and not the time to send them to the polls. Thanks, Mike. Mike LeCouture on the NDP campaign. He'll be tracking it closely for us. Justin Trudeau, Liberal leader, which is how 
for those of you at home, we'll be referring to the Prime Minister very shortly. Once a campaign kicks off, we no longer refer to him as the Prime Minister, except for matters dealing explicitly with the execution of government policies. The rest of the time, we refer to each leader as the leader of their parties. Uh, prior to dissolution, Parliament was made up of 155 Liberal MPs. The Conservatives held 119 seats. The Bloc had 32 seats. And then there was the NDP at 24. The Green Party held two seats down from three after one of their MPs crossed the floor, Jenica Atwin, to join the Liberals. And there were five independents along with one vacant seat. As we've noted, in order to pass legislation since forming government, the Liberals have had to rely on support from the Bloc or the NDP, that standard in minority parliaments. At times, it wasn't clear if that would lead to potential multiple confidence votes, which could have triggered elections earlier in the pandemic, but it seemed that nobody wanted those. So why are we having one now? What's changed? Well, let's find out from someone who takes the pulse of Canadians and knows the polls. Ipsos CEO Daryl Bricker. Daryl, the Liberals clearly have made the decision to launch an election because they think that they can not only grow their lead in the House, but from what I'm hearing, they think they can get a majority. How are the latest poll numbers playing out in terms of the Liberals' ability to capture that majority government? Well, at the moment, most Canadians think that the Liberals are going to win this election. Whether it will be a majority or a minority, they're not sure. Uh, but this creates a bit of a problem for the Liberal Party because if we end up exactly what, with what we have already um, uh, after this election is over, what's the point of even participating? So this election at the moment, it's not just about why we're having it, it's just there's a lack of enthusiasm about it. In fact, Mercedes, in the polling for Global National, it's interesting that the voters who are most interested in having the election are actually opposition voters. I'm just taking a look here at, at, at some of the numbers that, that you've been looking at, uh, Daryl, and, and how this is all going to play out. When you're looking at what could be the ballot box question here, especially as we're heading into a fourth wave, the pandemic is top of mind for people. How do Canadians see the government's performance and handling of this public health crisis? Well, they've actually think they've done a pretty good job in comparison, particularly to how the opposition parties might be able to manage the same issue. The Liberals have a really big lead, but it's one of the only issues on which they do have a big lead. So if this is about managing the pandemic and evaluating how the government has performed and will perform going forward, it's actually a good position for the Liberal Party to be in, to be talking about this issue. And speaking of that timing of an election call, which can mean everything, you call it too late and you can lose something uh, that Mr. Trudeau's father had to deal with and be concerned about when you call that election too early and you could lose too late, you miss your opportunity, especially with what's happening and a potential souring in the public opinion and the economy. But this time there's the added complication of a fourth wave of COVID-19. Let's just take a brief look at what the daily case count actually is since March of 2020. The first three waves are very clearly pronounced. You can see them on our graphic there. And you can see the beginning of the fourth wave there at the tail end of the graphic, which begs the question of whether an election can be concluded before there is a more significant spike. Uh, taking a look at that, Daryl, what's your thought on how this plays out and how the fourth wave factors as an election? Are voters going to look at this and think, you know what, uh, why did you trigger this? What are you doing? Or are they going to think, ooh, fourth wave, maybe we should go with the guys who we already know? Well, at the moment, we don't really know. But I think that the, the bigger implication for all of this is the effect that it has on turnout. What we know about the Liberal Party's last two victories is that they've had historically high turnout in order to win. In historically high by that I mean this century. So if you look back to Stephen Harper when he won his majority in 2011, 61% turnout. 2015, 2019, 68, 69% turnout. So if there's a fourth wave and it looks risky to get outside of your home or risky to, to do things that involve politics, the effect on the Liberal Party is potentially major. Daryl, with this increasing case positivity, you know, most people are, are now vaccinated in Canada. We're the most vaccinated country in the world. But that vaccine rollout certainly hit some rough patches. To what degree has that affected how people view the Liberals? Is it a thing of the past now that those who wish to be double vaxxed are? Or are people still remembering that? 
Well, that's the interesting thing we're going to see in the campaign, whether uh, the public is in the mood to actually reward for the government for its performance during the, uh, uh, during the, uh, the pandemic. And, and as David Aiken said previously, other minority governments that have gone for majorities have all won somewhat as a reward for their management of the pandemic. It'll be interesting to see if that's too far in the rearview mirror for, the, for, this, for this particular government and people are thinking about other things. In our most recent polling for Global, what we showed was that other issues that had been previously important were now starting to rise again in terms of the level of, of, of public interest. So I think it's not just going to be about the pandemic. There's going to be a series of other issues that people are going to be looking at. The economy, uh, inequality, housing, a whole series of other issues that are going to come into play. So it's not just going to be about that one single issue, which is how did you manage the pandemic? What kind of campaign are you expecting to he see here, Daryl? We know it's going to be a short one, 36 days. It's the absolute minimum uh, under federal law. What should Canadians be prepared to see? Well, I think what you're going to see at the start of this is everybody talking about you know, why we're having it, but we're going to get into a campaign. And the really interesting challenge that the Liberal Party has in a low enthusiasm election campaign in which it's just a game of inches, how they're able to take on all of the different parties in all of the different regions. Because if they lose a couple of points to the NDP, maybe a point or two to the, to the Conservatives, the whole strategy is over. And a minority government, uh, the worst result for the Liberals apart from losing, would be a minority government that requires them to get two parties support in order to pass their legislation. If that's where they end up in another minority situation, but instead of one party support, now they need two parties support, it'll be interesting to see how the Liberal Party judges Justin Trudeau. Thanks, Daryl. We'll be checking back with you just a little bit later in the program. Now, in order to trigger a new election, Justin Trudeau or a new government, if he, whoever gets elected here, we'll see. Uh, in any situation, when the prime minister decides that they want to trigger an election instead of waiting for the opposition to bring them down, they have to walk over and talk to the governor general about dissolving parliament. Um, this is typically a ceremonial process and the timing works out nicely here for the Trudeau government as Mary Simon was just installed as governor general just three weeks ago. Now, providing that she doesn't object to the request, what will happen today is that a sequence will be initiated setting the election dates and the issuing of election writs or orders to all electoral districts in the country to hold a vote. That's why for decades it's been called a writ drop, for those of you who are wondering why we use that weird term. Through parliamentary process, uh, geeks take issue with calling it a writ drop because of the semantics around the phrase, i.e. there are multiple writs that drop. But in any case, those of us who are nerding out politically can put that aside because today the same wheels will go into motion. A massive exercise exercise of democracy in Canada is about to take place. So, so what comes next? Well, well, each of the parties will name their candidates. Running across Canada's 338 electoral districts. Of course, the field will consist of hundreds of incumbents. Once the candidates list is official, next comes the campaign. Under federal law, the election must be held no fewer than 36 days after the dissolution of Parliament. However, it can be up to 50 days later. This time around, the election will be held on September 20th. That's a Monday. Then there's the matter of voting. Last year in the U.S. and in provincial elections here in Canada, the pandemic triggered a wave of advanced voting and vote by mail. Conditions are currently better in Canada, but some people could still be wary of big crowds at polls, particularly with the emergence of the Delta variant. So the timing of when people cast their ballots is an X factor this time around. Finally, there's the issue of counting votes. And again, it's likely to be different than in the past. Elections Canada is anticipating an unprecedented surge in those mail-in ballots. In the last federal election, out of 18.3 million ballots cast, just over 50,000 were sent in by mail. This time around, some experts estimate that number will be closer to 5 million, none of which can be opened until polls close. Global News got access to the inside of Elections Canada's headquarters where they've been getting ready. That includes prepping ballots and buying materials, including a staggering 16 million pencils. But ultimately, it comes down to the count. And if it's a squeaker, it's entirely possible we will not know the final result for a few days after election night.
Let's bring in our expert panel now. For the first time today, they're going to be walking us through this special coverage. It consists of federal president of the NDP, Denan J. Cole, liberal strategist Greg McEachern, and conservative strategist Kate Harrison. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, obviously, for partisans, this is like your Olympics. It's, uh, I would say Super Bowl, but it's not very Canadian. So I'll say it's like our Stanley Cup, perhaps, of politics as we get ready for all of this. Uh, let's start with you, Greg. Why do you think the Liberals have made this gamble to call it now? Because obviously it's a controversial thing to do this voluntarily during a pandemic. What's the calculus for your party here? Well, you know, there's lots of reasons why you can you can point to, you know, the lack of movement on the legis a lot of legislation in the spring. Uh, but the reality is, having worked for a provincial minority government, a federal minority government, I've been in Ottawa since 2004. We had elections in 06, and 08, and 11. The reality is, in a minority government, the party or parties that are in the best position to call an election will do so. And um, you know, I, I don't want to you know defeat any Pollyanna-like attitudes. But the reality is, if this was a good time for the Conservatives or the NDP to have pulled the plug, they would have. They did so in um, November 2005. So I think, you know, the calculus is that the Trudeau government has been governing for right in that sweet spot, 18 to 24 months is what it usually happens in, in Canada. We know we've had shorter minority governments. The Joe Clark government was only about nine months. But I think the calculus is that they think that they've got enough that they have gotten complete during an extremely tough time. Uh, and, and the time is now. The other thing that I would suggest is you know, the cabinet that the Prime Minister picked in the fall of 2019 is not a cabinet he picked in terms of handling a pandemic or building back the economy. And, you know, if I was an advisor to the Prime Minister, that's certainly the team that I would want to have around. The next government of Canada has a huge challenge in terms of getting back to so-called normal. And I think that's probably another reason why I would have pushed for an election if I was advising the Prime Minister. Kate, one of the big concerns for the Conservatives have been being able to differentiate themselves. I mean, you're coming out of a pandemic, or still in a pandemic, uh, heading into a fourth wave, which naturally tends to favour incumbents. And we have seen that with elections uh, that have been held in many places across Canada and around the world. Uh, obviously, the U.S. election a little different. That was a whole different kettle of fish in itself. But there have been several elections, and those who've called early haven't seemed to pay for it. In fact, those incumbent governments have often come back stronger than the first time. There was a lot of criticism around the Conservative campaign in 2019 that it looked too much like 2015. What are the Conservatives going to do differently this time? Well, I think it's important for the Conservatives to balance a message of uh, optimism with one of addressing the realities of the pandemic. Uh, there are going to be a lot of voters out there who are concerned uh, that we are having an election right now. Uh, there's still a lot of anxiety about the impact of the Delta variant. Uh, parents who are sending kids back to school are, are nervous about what that return looks like. Uh, so there's still a lot of anxiety around we, where we are at in the pandemic right now. The Conservatives are, are course, going to be talking about that, talking about uh, where there were missteps in the pandemic management and where we are um, at, at this point in that recovery. But I also think the Conservatives are going to be spending a lot of time talking about who Canadians can trust uh, to manage the economy, manage the pandemic. Uh, I think that it's important that there's a message there that's a bit more proactive and forward looking, not just uh, looking back at how the Liberals have managed this. If that's the ballot question, uh, that's not a good position for the Conservatives. I think it needs to be more than that. It needs to be about where we are headed as a country in managing the pandemic now and the economy in the future. Dananjay, obviously, uh, I'm sure the NDP must feel better starting out in this campaign than you did in the last one. A lot better prospects. Um, how do you think Jagmeet Singh translates this into votes? He has this huge social media presence. Uh, he's quite popular with young people. The NDP legitimately were key to a lot of the changes to the government programs. They pushed hard. They got what they wanted. Uh, I know liberals who thought that they would just eat the NDP's lunch, though, as a result of that and take the credit. So how do you get voters to not only um, give the NDP credit, but be willing to see you in a position to govern? 
Well, Mercedes, I think, um, you know, having the most popular leader of all of the parties helps, uh, whether we've been out in Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, you know, we've had people walking up to Jigmeet to want to talk to him about our plan that helps regular Canadians. Um, I think that we've seen a shift. Uh, I think people have seen that the NDP has actually put in a lot of work, pushed this government to actually uh, stand up for and deliver for Canadians. And, and I think people appreciate that work. And, and I think if the ballot question for us really is whether Canadians want a government that needs to be pushed to get anything accomplished or whether they want a government that's actually going to stand up for people. And, and I think uh, a lot of folks have, have seen what the NDP actually stands for during this pandemic and, and are willing to give us a, a shot in a whole bunch of seats. Um, you know, you 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 said uh, about the contrast with the 2015 and the 2019 campaigns. Uh, we're feeling really good. Uh, I think you know we're we're in a financially in a great spot. We've got great candidates all across the country, and we're really looking forward to getting our message out there about a plan that actually stands up for Canadians. Greg, how does the Prime Minister, and by the way, just for uh, our, our viewers at home's warning and your own, we are getting notice uh, that the Prime Minister is expected to show up momentarily, so I may have to jump in uh, and cut you off. My apologies if that happens, but we are expecting him to make that walk around 10 a.m., and we are now at 10.10, uh, so it could be happening any second. But Greg, how does the Prime Minister deal with the fact that he repeatedly said, we're not looking for an election? It's not a good time for an election. We're focused on Canadians. I mean, clearly they're planning for an election the whole time because you have a plane and bus wrapped, you have candidates in place. Uh, how much of an issue is that sincerity and that hypocrisy, having said they're not looking for election and now calling one themselves going to play? Well, I think you could ask any of the parties, if you're not preparing for an election when you're in a minority parliament, what are you doing? Uh, I think part of the challenge, the noise around this, I'm not sure this, um, you know, Canadians unhappy with an election. I'm not sure I've ever seen a poll where Canadians have said, yes, bring it on. I'm really happy. I'm not sure Canadians really enjoy them. And I go again, I go back to 04, 06, 08. We had an election every two years. Uh, the country survived. Uh, Liberal Party had its challenges at the time. I think, you know, part of the, uh, the, the test of this was the how quickly Canada ramped up our vaccines. I think we did extremely well. Obviously, there's huge concern about the Delta variant. But, you know, when you ask this, you know, if Jagmeet Singh was really concerned about the safety during an election, why did he campaign so strongly for Premier Horgan in British Columbia? Uh, why didn't uh, Aaron O'Toole criticize Premier Higgs in, in New Brunswick for stating he wanted a majority government and calling an election uh, to move from minority majority in, in New Brunswick, Saskatchewan? Where was Aaron O'Toole's criticism of the Premier there? So I think the reality is, you know, the, the challenge is we've got these provinces that want to open up very strongly, and we've seen some challenges in Alberta around that. So how do you kind of, uh, if you're the opposition, um, you know, parlay this message between, yeah, it's okay to have this election, but not a federal election, or it's okay for this province to open up their economy, but it's not okay for us to have an election. I think that the Delta variant and, and COVID will still be an, an issue and strongly a, a, a lot of strong awareness from Canadians at the start of the election. I'm not sure the Canadians, um, you know, are going to be too concerned. You know, in, in 2005, we had an election during Christmas. Liberals said, oh, Canadians will punish, you know, the Conservatives. They punish them by giving them a minority government. So I'm not sure it'll be the, the election being called will be the issue next week that it is today. Kate, how much of an issue do you think this is, pardon me, an election, do you think this is going to be about issues? I mean, obviously, the first thing that we expect to hear in the first few days is accountability from the Liberals on why, after saying they would not have an election, they are, in fact, calling an election. That's something the Conservatives have been focused in on. But by the time we get to Election Day, people have accepted, at least we're in it. And there's no indication in the polls that voters are necessarily going to actually punish the government for doing this, regardless of the say one, do thing say one thing, do another. Um, so where are the areas that the Conservatives think that they can make gains in terms of getting voters on board? Because um, it, it's not been a strong performance to date under Aaron O'Toole. Yeah, I, I think that there will have to be a pivot to your exact point, Mercedes, uh, away from why are we having an election to the fact that we're in one and how uh, conservatives Kate, I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump in for one moment there because we have news that we are heading to Rideau Hall. The prime minister has arrived. He is beginning his walk to the governor general. There you are. 
You see him, he is walking with his wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, and their three children over. Uh, this obviously, for all political families, is a big day. We always talk about the politicians. There are families behind them too, certainly for the O'Toole family and also for uh, Jagmeet Singh and his wife who are expecting a baby. So here we see the Prime Minister making his walk over. He's going to the Governor General's house where he will ask her to dissolve Parliament and formally begin the election process. He's not saying anything now. They never do on their way in. But once the meeting is over, we will expect to hear from Mr. Trudeau, the Liberal leader, first in delivering his remarks. So there he is heading over. Um, and in terms of what happens once he gets there for viewers, because we get a lot of questions of can he actually do this? Uh, the answer is yes, he can constitutionally, even though there is a fixed date election act that was passed by Prime Minister Harper and also broken, by the way, by Prime Minister Harper as well. You can always go early because of the Canadian Constitution. The governor general typically will only say no in two scenarios. That is if there has been a very recent election, essentially within the last nine months, or if there is a situation where there is another party capable of forming government or a coalition that wants to do it. Remember the coalition crisis that struck Canada back over a decade ago now. Um, none of those appear to be the case, and so the Prime Minister is expected to likely get what he's asking for, which is for the Governor General to allow for an election less than two years after the last one. And here we see uh, the Prime Minister about to head in there. Well, it's not out of the ordinary for a minority government, there is an element of uniqueness to Mr. Trudeau's decision today. I think we may have Mr. Lagasse on hold here in the background, who's a constitutional expert. Uh, we can go to him as we watch this walk. Uh, Mr. Lagasse, what are you expecting today once the Prime Minister walks through those doors? Hi, Mercedes. Well, typically the Prime Minister will meet with the Governor General. They'll have a brief discussion in this case about uh, why the request for the dissolution is being made, uh, when Parliament will be summoned uh, after the election, uh, and what the date of the election would be. Uh, as you can see there, we just saw the Clerk of the Privy Council and the Secretary of the Governor General uh, waiting for the Prime Minister. They will have at this stage prepared uh, three proclamations, one to dissolve Parliament, one telling the Chief Electoral Officer to get some writs ready, and the other one telling us when uh, Parliament's going to be back. Oh, we were so just, we're uh, setting sorry, go same. ahead. We're setting the stage basically to take all the formal legal measures necessary uh, to uh, hold this election and dissolve parliament. And thereafter, uh, I expect the prime minister will come out probably in front of Rideau Hall, which is a relatively recent innovation, but uh, it seems this is what prime ministers like to do now. And he'll probably uh, tell us why he felt it was necessary to dissolve parliament at this time. And uh, my understanding was that Rideau Hall was not thrilled with that development of prime ministers giving campaign speeches in front of Rideau Hall, which is supposed to be a non-partisan institution in Canada, but obviously things have evolved in that direction. Uh, we were just talking about the fact that the, the Governor General, and you and I were talking about this the other day, can theoretically always say no. That's not expected to happen in this situation because there hasn't been a very recent election and there's no one else ready to jump in and form government. Um, when the Governor General is considering this request. Do you have a sense of how long we expect this to take? Will it be fast? Will it be slow? What are you expecting on that? I suspect it'll be fairly quick. Uh, again, this is not uh, an area where the Governor General would be able to exercise much discretion. Uh, the conditions that you mentioned earlier that had there been a recent election or if some of the opposition parties were claiming that they could form government and make this parliament work, that could create, in theory, a bit of pause on the part of the governor general. Neither of those conditions is being met right now. So it really depends on how much time Ms. Simon wishes to spend with the prime minister to discuss things and that kind of dynamic. But I would imagine that the prime minister is eager to get back in front of the doors there and tell us uh, what's happening in terms of his logic. And we're just watching uh, as this unfolds, the Prime Minister and his family making their walk across Rideau grounds. Of course, normally they would be coming from 24 Sussex, but because uh, it is currently set to receive renovations, the Prime Minister and his family have been living on the grounds uh, at Rideau Hall, not very far at all from the Prime Minister. I can see them coming up uh, on the Governor General's home, Rideau Hall, right now. Uh, let's take a look as we watch the Prime Minister 
prepare to go inside here. We're just waiting a few moments. This is history unfolding as we watch the 2021 election about to kick off. The Prime Minister on his way through those front doors of Rideau Hall to ask Mary Simon, the new Governor General just appointed by Mr. Trudeau, to dissolve Parliament and head into the election campaign. There we go. The doors are closing. We'll never know exactly what was said uh, behind that. Let's go to our David Aiken, who's on the ground there. David, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? We just saw the Prime Minister go through the doors there. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's fantastic weather uh, today to be out here <laughs> hanging around outside Rideau Hall. And as you mentioned, uh, the Prime Minister's family live literally, I don't know, maybe a few hundred feet behind Rideau Hall. They are living in Rideau Cottage, and it's not really a cottage either. It's a big, huge mansion, but that's what it's called, Rideau Cottage. So, yeah, so they've just gone in, uh, greeted by, uh, uh, as uh, Phil Legacy, Professor Legacy was saying, uh, greeted by the Secretary uh, for the Governor General, greeted by the uh, the, the um, uh, the clerk of the Privy Council. Those are sort of the two officials uh, that sort of have to be present. Uh, they're bureaucrats to uh, watch what happens and witness the discussion. So we'll see how long it takes. But as I said, it's a fabulous day. Sunny ways, right? Wasn't that what the Prime uh, Justin Trudeau first campaigned on? He's got that today. And um, and then the Prime Minister, the Liberal leader, once he's done here, he'll speak to us. And then he's off to Montreal. That's where he's going to overnight tonight. He will be leaving town and sort of going on a tour, if you will. Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, as our colleague Mike Couture, Michael Couture was pointing out, is already in Montreal. The Pride event is happening in Montreal today. Jagmeet Singh will participate. Justin Trudeau will not participate out of some public health uh, concerns. Uh, so that's where they go. And we'll hear from Aaron O'Toole, who is at a specially built TV facility. That's where Abigail Beeman was, of course. And uh, Yves-Francois Blanchet, the uh, Bloc Québécois leader, of course. He'll be sticking in Quebec for the whole campaign. And we'll hear later from uh, the Green Party leader, Annamie Paul. The Green Party, you know, in the last election, just we haven't talked a lot about them, but the Greens in the last election, 2019, I really thought they had an opportunity, the last election with Elizabeth May as leader. Um, and they did, you know, they, they did not too badly on their popular vote, but they really, and they won that seat in Fredericton, but really didn't have that breakthrough. And right now the Green Party is in complete disarray. Half the party's warring with its leader, wants a new leader. Um, they seem to be broke, um, and I think that is going to be the benefit of the Liberals on the East Coast and the benefit to the New Democrats on the West. So that's just one other sort of thing to watch uh, throughout this campaign. The absence or the ebbing of the Green support, where does it go and who will it help? Now, a key question. I, I can't recall ever seeing a federal party implode the way the Green Party has so close to an election, uh, willing to attack their own leader. Uh, it will be very interesting to see where that goes. Last election, as you said, we were having a very different discussion about maybe it will be the Green Party's time. That didn't happen. Uh, David, I want to talk to you because, you know, you are a great knower of political history uh, and fellow political nerd like me. How uh -oh. uncommon is it to see a prime minister make the decision to bring down their own minority government? I mean, Jean Chrétien did it with a, a majority government. Uh, went early. Uh, but this decision now, a lot of folks are upset about because they're saying, well, it breaks a law that states that federal elections should be held every four years. Uh, obviously, we know that's that's not, I mean, it does break the law. However, the Constitution overrides the law. But there's the political calculus in this, too, uh, of how unusual or common it would be for a prime minister to make the decision um, to hit the hustings when they believe it's advantageous for them and not wait for the opposition or that fixed election date. I don't think it's unusual at all, in fact. In fact, it's what any premier or prime minister who is leading a minority government is looking to do all the time, and that's turn their minority into a majority. So it is not unusual. What is unusual and what is unique right now is that the world and Canada are in the midst of a pandemic, a public health hazard, where in most jurisdictions, the public health authorities are saying, please avoid large gatherings, certainly be socially distanced and so on. And to that extent, that's where the person precipitating this election, uh, that would be Justin Trudeau, uh, has to speak to how he thinks this can be done safely. And I got to say, uh, there's going to be 250,000 Canadians who will go to work for Elections Canada. I don't know if you know that, but it takes a lot of people 
to mount a general election. These are people who count the ballots, people who are manning the returning offices and so on. 250,000 people. And the chief electoral officer has been saying for months it's going to be very difficult to hire 250,000 people in a pandemic because most of those people are often older people, retired people, um, and they're the people who are saying, I'm not going to be going out near crowds. I'm going to hang around at a polling place. So that's an issue. The chief electoral officer also made several requests of the government to make this election even safer for election workers and for uh, and for voters among them to change the voting day by law the voting day the general election day has to be on a Monday and we're going to hear the Prime Minister we assume name the general election day of Monday September 20th the chief electoral officer said that's not the safest day of the week we'd rather do it over two days on a Saturday and Sunday why wouldn't it be safe on a Monday well for one thing a lot of times polling places are in schools and many school authorities in the provincial elections we saw forbade any election happening in their schools they don't want strangers possibly clearing carrying COVID into schools and so it's more difficult to find polling places also one single polling day is 12 hours long that means poll workers are wearing a mask and they're going to be tired for 12 hours the chief electoral officer said please change to saturday and sunday we'll have two eight-hour days now those requests and others were made by the chief electoral officer in november the government put together some legislation to make those changes and the government never passed them so justin trudeau is going into this election with the same old rules that the chief electoral officer wanted changed to better protect the health and safety of 250,000 election workers as well as the 15 million people who will vote in this election and he failed to do that and I think that will be something that he will be held to account for if we do see some spikes uh, anywhere in the country as a result of this election. I should point out that in parliamentary hearings over the spring we heard from the chief electoral officers and public health officers from BC, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador and they all testified that they did not or they could not trace any spikes in uh, infections in those provinces to the elections in those provinces. But it's definitely something that is going to be monitored. Did this election, is it a, a risky bet given the public health environment right now? And even if there aren't spikes in schools, the possibility there could be a case on one of the leaders' campaigns and what that would look like. It could potentially shut down a tour completely. Uh, for reporters like you and I, David, who are on the campaigns, I'm going to be traveling uh, with Liberal leader Justin Trudeau, still the Prime Minister, until he walks out of there with this Parliament dissolved. Uh, we are going to have to take uh, rapid tests every time before we get on a plane or bus to change locations. Uh, we have to plan for what happens if there is a scenario where somebody tests positive. Um, and the reality that some of these campaigns could be hitting multiple provinces in a day. If that happens and you have a positive test, um, the optics on that could be a real issue. If there is something that happens at one of these events, even though all the campaigns have said they're clearly going to stick to observing uh, provincial rules and regulations on gatherings, you're not going to see the big rallies you've seen in the past, but one case or any kind of a super spreader event, uh, and it could be very damaging both to the campaign that it happens on, and it could be very politically damaging as well to Mr. Trudeau for having called this election. So those are things um, that were certainly going to be on the lookout for both professionally and personally. Also going to be an issue with the Conservative campaign. Let's head over there now. We have our Abigail Beeman. Uh, Mr. O'Toole has made uh, about seven stops over the past four weeks, pre-campaign stops, and they came with promises like guaranteeing every Canadian will have access to high-speed internet by 2025. That's especially been an issue in rural areas of Canada. And while that may not seem like a blockbuster commitment, it certainly is for those in the rural communities who are hoping to have access for that and have heard many promises about it over the years. Uh, let's go now to our Abigail Beeman, who is at Conservative headquarters waiting for this to go. Uh, Abigail, just before we start to get into some of those issues there, I want to talk to you about what the protocols are going to be for the Conservative campaign before you travel. What's the deal with vaccination? Do you have to prove it? Will you have to rapid test? What are the safety protocols being put in place? Yeah, all great questions. So uh, we had to, of course, uh, like we do with any campaign, fill out a form ahead of time in terms of uh, it, it, 
travel information, personal information to provide. But this time we had to provide proof of vaccination. So I've already sent that in uh, to the party proof of double vaccination. Uh, and that is uh, the wording on the form is, is around uh, the provinces that require that. So Manitoba, for example, if you don't show proof of double vaccination when you enter Manitoba, you need to quarantine for 14 days. So uh, the party is requiring proof of double vaccination uh, to be part of this campaign. Uh, and I also had to, uh, I believe it was tick a box that said that I would be uh, open to rapid testing uh, as, as often as daily. So we'll see exactly how that will play out. I did not have to take a rapid test to come to this downtown Ottawa hotel for now, uh, but expect that there will be some of that testing as uh, this campaign gets on the move. Uh, Abigail, when we were talking about that broadband issue, obviously the Tories are looking for some retail politics that are going to play up. We know rural areas tend to vote more conservative than they do liberal in a lot of cases in Canada, so that's an advantage. Uh, but they're going to have to do more than that in order to win. Part of the reason why Aaron O'Toole was chosen as the conservative leader was the perception that he could broaden the party's appeal. He was the so-called red Tory, and it's the difference between a leadership campaign and an election campaign, because in the leadership campaign, they kept saying, he's not a red Tory, he's a blue Tory, but they're probably going to want to play him as a red Tory publicly to Canadians in the hopes that he will vote. In terms of policy, what are we expecting to see for some of the key changes in the Conservative platform that would try to expand that big blue tent, uh, and also in the way that the Conservative Party is going to be presenting themselves to voters? Well, first of all, a lot of that we will obviously be waiting at wait. It will be a wait and see until we get that campaign platform. And that's a big question. There's a lot of strategy that goes into, you know, when to drop that platform. At what point during the campaign uh, do you do that? Last time around in 2019, it was a very late uh, platform drop. We're hearing that there will be a lot of attention being paid this time around to that platform. So that would suggest that we may see some of those concrete promises earlier. Uh, like you said, the leader was uh, touring the country country, uh, giving some hints about what, what would be in that platform. You can expect a heavy focus on jobs and the recovery out of this pandemic. How do you move forward out of this pandemic? There, were, there was already an announcement uh, that focused heavily on jobs training. Uh, there will be a lot of talk about uh, the economic recovery, uh, as well as, you know, preparedness to be prepared for the next time around. The Conservatives refer to that as resilience, uh, things like being prepared with uh, PPE next time around, uh, domestic vaccine production, getting the early warning system uh, back to uh, to a better state. Uh, so all of those things we expect to hear more of during the campaign. But in terms of broadening the tent, I think something that will be very interesting to watch, of course, is where the Conservatives stand on climate. And you saw the plan that was rolled out in the spring. It was mm, convoluted maybe the most appropriate word in terms of uh, it, it didn't get a big draw from people. There was this idea of a, a personal savings account uh, for Canadians that it didn't really resonate. But at the same time, there were a lot of people excited uh, to hear about the Conservatives talking about uh, a climate policy in some different terms and, and hearing about a carbon tax uh, in that way. I, I mentioned earlier the last time you came to me about the uh, internal turmoil over uh, carbon policy. We at the Conservative convention, you saw the party vote down a resolution that had the words climate change is real in that. That came pretty soon before uh, Aaron O'Toole then launched that climate policy that had carbon tax in there. So if you're talking about uh, policy to watch that will broaden that tent, bring more people in, I think where they move uh, with uh, climate will be will be interesting to see. Abigail, we got a flash this week of what could become a wedge issue in this campaign. Where does Aaron O'Toole stand on the question of mandatory vaccinations, which seems like it's becoming more and more of a flashpoint for Canadians? Uh, a very good question. Hoping to hear some more from him on that today. Uh, just to, to, to remind people, we got this late day Friday announcement from the federal government that uh, vaccines were going to be mandatory for not just the not just the federal public service, but also all federally regulated industries as well as commercial travelers. So people taking uh, interprovincial trains, planes, talking about cruise ships as well. So really hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people uh, would be affected uh, by this 
this decision by the Liberal government. And when we went to the Conservatives for reaction to this, uh, they sent back an interesting statement saying, you know, as Aaron O'Toole has, has said many times in the past, that he encourages all Canadians to get vaccinated. But then there was also a line in there about believing that uh, in, in Canadians being able to make their own health choices. So we, we pushed back and asked, OK, so where does he stand then on mandatory vaccination? You're talking about a choice. You're also talking about Canadians need to get vaccinated. That doesn't really answer the question about mandatory vaccinations in these industries. Do you support this? Do you not? Seems like he is setting it up as a wedge issue. We've heard the NDP saying that, you know, they're open to mandatory uh, vaccination. There there hasn't been a lot of pushback from the unions, as, as, as you may have expected that there could have been. So far, we, we have not seen that. And obviously, the Liberals are, are hearing that, the, that this is very popular. You know, we, we saw it come in sort of step by step. First, Ontario universities uh, were announcing that there would be mandatory vaccination for people on campus. Then you saw BC make the announcement for, for health care workers. And over Overall, it seems to be pretty popular. So it will be interesting uh, to see uh, where the Conservatives land on that issue and if it will become more divisive uh, during the campaign. There are obviously people who don't believe that that is the right way to go. Uh, but uh, we'll see if uh, Aaron O'Toole will be more clear on his position. Abigail, parties like the Bloc and the NDP will be able to argue that they contributed directly to legislation by propping the Liberals up over the past two years. The Conservatives also have made comments on the legislation and made suggestions that were adapted, perhaps not as visibly in some cases as the NDP or the Bloc. How is O'Toole going to play that with voters about his party's contribution to the pandemic programs and pandemic spending, which is going to be likely one of the ballot box issues? Well, I think that back, way back at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of cross-party, nonpartisan collaboration in terms of getting those initial, very early supports out to Canadians uh, in terms of working together when everybody was just literally figuring things out. How is this going to work? Uh, you know, how is Parliament going to work moving forward? I'm talking very in the early stages of uh, of the pandemic. Certainly all parties were working together. Then, as you say, uh, you know, the, the, the Conservatives certainly stalled and blocked on some other issues. I think there was a lot of frustration from uh, other people in the House when that came to pandemic relief or pandemic spending. Uh, and then, obviously, the Conservatives voted against the budget uh, when at, 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 at budget time. But uh, moving forward, I think, it, to, to your point, I think that uh, Aaron O'Toole will speak to the reasons why uh, Conservatives pushed back against certain legislation. I think perhaps uh, Bill C-10 may be a good example of that in terms of updating the Broadcasting Act. Conservatives were saying that this infringed on free speech and that they couldn't vote in favor of it. And then the Liberals really did a very poor job of trying to set their messaging straight uh, and trying to straighten out that whole issue. So, you know, where Conservatives push back, I think Aaron, Toole, Aaron O'Toole will argue that, they, that they, the reasons why uh, that happened, but certainly there was some a lot of frustration along the way when you saw uh, stalling that took place. And, and, and we've heard from the Prime Minister that uh, that's become his refrain, right, that the opposition has been, has been blocked the Liberals' ability to, to get things done. So definitely two sides to, to that story, and, and we'll be watching to see what that messaging will be. Thanks, Abigail. I know you'll be watching that closely for us. If you're just joining us now, we are waiting as the Prime Minister is inside Rideau Hall at this moment. Let's head over to the NDP campaign now. The NDP leader recently made headlines by calling on the Governor General to deny Prime Minister Trudeau's request to dissolve Parliament. Jagmeet Singh says the minority government has been able to function just fine and having a general election during a fourth wave of COVID-19 would be irresponsible. So let's head back to Montreal now where the NDP campaign will be kicking off and our Mike Le Couture is. Mike, what's the symbolism behind kicking off the NDP's campaign in Montreal today? Well, there is a little bit, and there also is just some basic scheduling. First, the scheduling. Jagmeet Singh was already planning to come to Pride Parade here in Montreal, which is happening a little later on this afternoon. Uh, 
And secretly, some of the NDP handlers are telling me they're pretty happy that it's happening today because they were going to stay here no matter what, and they were going to launch from here no matter what, and that he is seemingly going to be the only federal party leader, uh, national federal party leader, who's going to be walking in the pride parade because, as David said earlier in the show, that Justin Trudeau will not be coming here. Uh, and so Jagmeet Singh really wants that imagery, not only today, but throughout the campaign, that while Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is calling an election to hold on to power that Jagmeet Singh is the one who's really with the people and trying to fight for the people. Uh, the other really key symbolism here though being in Quebec Mercedes is the fact that Quebec you'll remember back in 2011 uh, is where the orange wave started for Jack Layton uh, and that was really the fortress for this party. Now obviously that didn't happen in the last election they lost all but one seat in this province. They're hoping for a little bit of back to future back to the future Mercedes with with a couple of their candidates from that orange wave, you have uh, Brigitte Sanssouci, uh, who is, uh, sh she was running, or she had run, she was the MP for Saint-Hyacinthe-Bagot. She will be running again this time around. And also Francois Choquette, uh, who is in the riding of Dramin, which is just east of, uh, of Montreal here. Uh, and he is also going to be back. Both of those lost in 2019. They're hoping to channel some of that Jack Layton feel. Of course, on the eve of the 10th anniversary of Jack Layton's death, something else that will be marked by Jagmeet Singh uh, when that happens a little later on during the campaign uh, and something that may also bolster this campaign as they go on. Uh, I was also talking to Alexandre Boulouris, who is their only MP on the island of Montreal. Uh, he's here waiting for Jagmeet to arrive with his wife, by the way, uh, Jagmeet's wife. They just announced on social media uh, that they are having a baby, so that'll be something else uh, that will be front and center here. Uh, his his wife uh, Gurkiran, who will be coming, uh, will be part of the campaign as she was in 2019, uh, and likely, you know. Picturing him uh, as an expecting father will be something that the NDP will likely be trying to do as well. Uh, but Boulogues was telling me that, yeah, this is really a different campaign, um, mainly because of the pandemic, uh, trying to make sure that they do the door-to-door -door in a safe manner. He said around May they were already doing some sort of test runs on that, uh, going to talk to people about a number of different issues. And they're saying that if you're wearing a mask and you're at a bit of a distance, that people seem comfortable. Uh, but the biggest difference is that his campaign office is ready to go and they'll be having a launch party uh, at some point this week but with nobody in it so it'll be virtual uh, and that's what they just have to do now understanding that this will be a very different campaign and not possibly being able to feel uh, feel the campaign because that's what a lot of these rallies are right Mercedes uh, you can see the momentum we saw that with Jack Layton in 2011 where people were rushing across the street stopping their car double parking their car just to go shake his hand and go see him same thing with Justin Trudeau in 2015, you saw him pack those arenas and that momentum was very visible on the campaign. You won't be able to see this now when we're going to have this mix uh, of, of virtual and in-person events, uh, but really limiting it. And that's partly the reason that we're at Parc La Fontaine here uh, in just sort of east of downtown Montreal and uh, that we're outside doing this. You're going to see a lot of this now. Uh, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh being outside trying to meet people at a distance, the elbow bumps, the masks, everything. Everything. Uh, also worth noting, if anybody is coming to Montreal, I'm going to give you a bit of tourist advice. La Banquise is the best poutine in all of Montreal. It's around the corner from here. Uh, and Mercedes, I'm not going to say that after this hit, I might be going there. But <laughs> if you see some gravy on my tie, that might be re the reason why. Well, uh, I, I am heading to Montreal tonight with the Liberal campaign, so I'm, I'm going to need you to text me the name of that place so I can get some excellent poutine. Uh, oh, but there, it'll cost you, but sure, but sure. <laughs> uh, Mike, you know, uh, great food, of course, in many stops across this country: Alberta steak, Atlantic Canadian fish, two of the other places where the NDP leader has been recently, where he claimed that the party is directly responsible for the enhancement of pandemic benefits. Uh, like CERB and the CRB. Is that a fair assessment of what transpired? Well, 
Yeah, I mean, somebody's got to take credit for it, right? Because everything that happened, or everything that was passed in Parliament, uh, the Liberals needed a dance partner in a minority government, right? So a lot of the time, some of these negotiations were the NDP making suggestions and making sure that they continued to prop up the Liberals. Uh, so certainly they are going to be taking credit for it on the campaign trail. They will be going around saying, hey, Canadians, look, if you really enjoyed or if you had to be on the CERB or the CRB, uh, that was due in large part that we bolstered it and we helped improve those benefits. Same thing uh, with the wage subsidy. We're hearing that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic that the Liberals were in negotiations with all parties and trying to figure out how much to make the wage subsidy. Then the NDP says that the Liberals came to the table saying that they were going to make it a 10% uh, wage subsidy being paid by the government and that the NDP fought to have it uh, pushed up to 70%, which followed a lot of other countries around the world. Uh, and so they're happy to take that victory lap um, and saying that and again as I said earlier uh, their pitch is going to be this is what we did with 24 MPs in the House of Commons imagine what we could do with more uh, and that is the key that, that Jagmeet Singh will be trying to sort of push out there on the campaign trail. As you said, in places like Atlantic Canada, in places uh, like the prairies, uh, where they were hard hit by the pandemic, all places were hard hit by it, but places where they're trying to make inroads. Uh, and NDP insiders are telling me they're looking in non-traditional areas now. They are going to be campaigning in non-traditional areas because they believe they can grow there. Uh, they believe that they can make inroads at places where they hadn't in the past. Uh, you know, will that actually translate into votes is another question completely because uh, you might be able to get there or you might be able to try and reach out to those areas, but can that translate into votes and will it be enough votes to elect somebody instead of just making the margin uh, of loss a little closer? That's something uh, to be seen. Thanks, Mike. We'll be checking back with you on uh, not only the campaign, but where to get the good eats, I guess. Unfortunately, though, it has been a very different kind of story for the Green Party. It's been in the news for all of the wrong reasons as of late. First off, one of its three members of Parliament, not very many to begin with there, crossed the floor to join the Liberals. Her name was Jenica Atwin. Then the infighting started over Anime Paul's leadership. It poured up out into the public domain, including leaks that indicated the party was actually blocking her funding and considering a non-confidence vote to remove her. The question now is whether the Greens can even hold on to the two seats that they had. Let's take a look as well at the Bloc Québécois. They had a strong 2019 election, and leader Yves-François Blanchet says that his party still has room to grow. Quebec has a total of 78 seats up for grabs, which makes it a key target in the election. The Bloc won 32 of those seats the last time around, but failed to make a significant dent in Greater Montreal. Blanchette has already alluded that success in that region will be critical if the party is to gain a greater presence in the House of Commons. With more about this campaign about to get underway, let's take a look at some of the tight races that could make a difference between another minority government after all of this or the potential majority that the Liberals are seeking. So far, BC's lower mainland appears to be in play, with an estimated 12 ridings up for grabs. Our projections at Global News currently indicate that the Liberals are in line to steal at least five of those seats. The remaining seven will be heavily contested. The Greater Toronto and Hamilton area will feature a number of tight races, many of which could be decided by as little as one to two percentage points. Though at this time, it looks like most of the incumbents are in line to keep their jobs. Joining me now with more insight about the upcoming race is Ipsos CEO Daryl Bricker. Daryl, some of the margins we're seeing in key ridings are absolutely paper thin. What do you make of these races? I think it's an extremely important point, Mercedes, and I'm glad you're making it because we, we tend to think of the national numbers and the national elections. But the truth is, this is a whole series of elections all across the country, and it only adds up to what the natural, national result is going to be. So understanding where the real battlegrounds are is it, it, very important to understanding the dynamics of the election campaign. And I think you've hit on two really important points. What's going to happen in Ontario, but also more importantly, in some ways, what's going to happen in B.C.? 
Daryl, if the election were held today, and of course it won't be, it'll be held on September 20th, what are the best possible outcomes for each, each party? If, if they're able to uh, live their dream, of course, we all say majority government uh, if they have their choice, but realistically, what's the best performance that we can expect from the various parties? For the Liberal Party, it really is winning a majority. I mean, they've got the best possible minority government you could have at the moment. Uh, going back to that, or maybe even a reduced minority where you need two parties instead of just one, uh, would be a bit of a disaster for them. For the Conservative Party, it would be pushing above 30 points and, and uh, at least maintaining its position as the official opposition. And for the NDP, it's getting back into the mid-20s um, in terms of popular support and picking up some seats from the Liberal Party. The Bloc Québécois, as long as it does what it did in the last election campaign, they'll probably be pretty happy. They will assist in holding the Liberals to a minority. And as far as the Green Party, just getting through this thing is probably what they want to do. Daryl, I'm just looking down at my phone here because we have some breaking news about Afghanistan. As you know, Kabul is expected to fall within hours. Uh, I have multiple Canadian veterans contacting me saying that there are hundreds of former Canadian interpreters still on the ground who have not been evacuated. The Canadian government has promised to get them out, but they have shut down the embassy. Global News first reported on Thursday exclusively that the embassy was in full rip-out mode. If you've seen the movie Argo, you know what that looks like. They're burning classified documents. They're preparing to leave. Uh, my understanding is that the last plane with Canadian staff from the embassy and Afghan staff from the embassy has departed. You had the Liberals come out late in the week and announce at the last minute they were bringing in 20,000 Afghan refugees. Obviously, uh, that was a decision applauded by many, but there's questions about how that's going. It's not a good series of pictures to be looking at as a government announces a campaign. Helicopters taking off from embassies and, uh, you know, uncertainty about what's happening to people who the, uh, the government previously relied upon, um, uh, who could you know, be in life-threatening situations in which we don't have immediate answers. These are not the kinds of things that are going to be necessarily um, papered over with saying you're gonna bring in 20,000 refugees, exactly what that means, you know, who knows. So yeah, I think it's gonna cause a bit of a wobble at the start of this, and depending on how this goes over the next couple of weeks, it could become an issue. And for our viewers, um, I will do my best to get you the photos that are being sent to me by former Canadian interpreters on the ground. They're in the streets with their families. They are afraid that they have hours, maybe days, to live before the Taliban finds them and executes them with no apparent way out, despite the government promise to bring 20,000 Afghan refugees here. Uh, for those urgently under threat, the question is how. I also have confirmation that 100 Gurkhas, those are Nepalese uh, private contractors who protected the Canadian embassy, have been left behind. They were not on the final plane of Canadians, uh, which has left today. We will be asking the Prime Minister this question today. Obviously, those who have served and protected Canadians, uh, including uh, myself when I was in Afghanistan and a number of other Canadian soldiers and diplomatic staff, were wondering what their future is going to be and we'll be keeping a close eye on that for you. But looking at the overall election, Daryl, in the eyes of voters, uh, how does the arrival of a fourth wave compare to the government successfully delivering a two-back summer? Well, it, it just it brings a big unknown into the campaign, exactly what does a fourth wave mean and how is the government going to respond to this and, and also how the provincial governments are going to respond to this as well. Because people watch what's going on with the, uh, with, uh, the pandemic almost like an emergency broadcast every day. And as ca cases go up, they get very concerned and they adjust their behavior. Not only could it affect how they regard uh, the government calling this election, but it could also affect their electoral behavior, whether they decide to participate or not. And as we've discussed before, Mercedes, the Liberals need a high turnout to do well. And if turnout is lower, it actually probably helps the opposition parties. Daryl, when it comes to the door-to-door -door campaigning, uh, I'm hearing the Liberals are planning to actually do quite a bit of this. Um, and I expect others will too. It'll be interesting to see how voters respond to that. How do you expect parties to try to make a pandemic connection when you can't have the big rallies? And who benefits the most when you can't get out and have the big tours? Uh, I've, I've met with all the leaders. I know all of the leaders. Uh, Justin Trudeau certainly likes his big rallies and he's not gonna be able to have them, but he's also an incumbent and that tends to be an advantage. 
Well, you know, we tend to exaggerate the level of impact all these get out the vote campaigns and technology and all the rest of it has in campaigns. This isn't the United States. We don't have millions and millions of dollars to spend on this. It tends to be fairly amateurish, run by a lot of volunteers. So the party that's better organized is the one that's going to do well. But also the party that has the most motivated supporters is the party that's going to do well because they don't need the party to get them out. So the real one of the real polling challenges that we're going to be having as we go through this campaign is is assessing exactly that point. If it's going to be a lower turnout election and there isn't a lot of enthusiasm in one of the party's uh, uh, groups of supporters, that could lead to some surprises. And, and it's one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, as a pollster, you sit back and you really are concerned about. This is an election like no other. Daryl, thank you so much. We'll check back in with you again soon. Thank you, Mercedes. With more on the Liberal Party and its positioning and also what's happening at Rideau Hall as we continue to wait for the Prime Minister to come out and see whether the Governor General has granted his request to dissolve Parliament and go into a 2021 fall pandemic election. We have our David Aiken. David, let's talk about some of the promises that the Liberals have made or anticipated to make. My inbox is a virtual flurry of announcements this morning before the rip drops. So what are those big key promises expected to be from the Liberals? Well, I think that there's, there's promises that they're going to make, promises they've made did they keep. I mean, that really, if you're an incumbent government, you're running, of course, on your record. And I think the Liberals will talk about some of the promises that they've kept or partially kept, but they're going to be open to criticism on some they haven't. So let's talk about promises kept. And I'll talk about parents, the parent voter. The parent voter has been, I think, the favorite target of a lot of parties, starting way back with Stephen Harper, when the conservatives of his day offered parents who had kids, you know, 100 bucks a month for your kids. That was the Harper child benefit. Trudeau shows up in 2015 and says, I'm going to improve on that, make it even richer, and he did. And I think that was a very popular program for some parents who were getting thousands of dollars a year for their kids. Recently, the Trudeau government has just enriched the Canada Child Benefit. You apply for it on your tax form every year. So that's very popular, is giving money to kids. So there's promise made, and I think that is the key promise kept. Now, speaking of parents and kids, what about child care? The Liberals have been promising a national child care program for, I don't know what, 20 years? Um, and it's all never really sort of happened. But this time around, you'll remember in the, in the most recent budget, a finance minister and deputy prime minister, Christian Freeland, said, we're going to make a deal with the provinces that will see $10 a day child care across the country within a few years. And I, I got to tell you, I'm a little surprised at the speed at which they've been delivering on that promise. It's not complete yet, but just recently, Saskatchewan, Scott Moe, the conservative premier there, one of those resistance premiers that doesn't like Trudeau very much, he signed on with the federal government to do a deal to bring $10 a day child care to Saskatchewan. And that means that program's going, the, the $10 a day child care is ready to go BC, ready to go Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, Newfoundland, Labrador, all the Atlantic provinces, just missing Ontario, just missing Alberta, where we have two other, quote, resistance premiers that probably didn't want to give Trudeau that, that political cover. So child care, promise, that's a big promise, probably kept. Now, another promise that the Liberals have been making for a while, National Pharmacare. And on that one, not very much work done at all. Nowhere near a National Pharmacare program. And I guarantee you, you're going to hear Jugmeet Singh and the NDP really beat the drum on that. That is a, a, the poll show, National Pharmacare is a very popular idea. It's a complicated program to negotiate with the provinces. You've got to negotiate with the provinces as well as with drug companies. But uh, Jugmeet Singh won't care. He's going to say, where the heck have the, the Trudeau Liberals been on, on National Pharmacare? Then there's a couple other outstanding that I think are important, not to a lot of, not, that, that don't directly affect a lot of voters, but are important to voters. And there I'm thinking about some of the drinking water advisories still in place in many of our First Nations communities. They say, not a lot of Canadians, most Canadians, millions of Canadians, have access to clean drinking water, but far too many Canadians uh, living on First Nations reserves do not have access to clean drinking water. Trudeau promised that he Get, get all those advisories done, cleaned up, get systems in place. They've made progress on it, but they haven't done that. And again, you should see some criticism on that. So I think those, think of parents, think of pharma care, think of child care, and think of the drinking water advisories on First Nations reserved as some promises made, some promises kept, some promises still to be fulfilled. 
David, the Liberals have had a lot of ups and downs since 2019. There was the We Charity scandal and sexual misconduct in the military, to name just a couple. Do you expect any of these missteps will have an impact on the race, or is it just a wild card once the campaign kicks off? You know, this is where often I got, I know I'm in the Ottawa bubble, and I'm real bubbled today uh, here with all the other parliamentary press gallery reporters, and we've been gossiping away. And I can tell you, I'm sure, Mercedes, you may have shared this feeling, that in the last election, for sure we thought that whole, uh, the, the SNC-Lavalin scandal, the resignations of Jody, Wil Jody Wilson-Raybould and, and Jane Philpott, and then the black face scandal in the middle of the campaign, we thought, oh my gosh, that's certainly got to hurt uh, the Trudeau brand. And yet, I think, I don't know, maybe Daryl Bricker pulled on it, but I don't think it factored into a lot of... Canadians' choices, or, or if they did, it was a couple of weeks that they sort of frowned and, and whatever. So that was the 2019 election. Now, you're right, since then, we have had some other sort of issues around ethics. And, you know, the, the reporting that, that you've led on the, the military sexual misconduct, you know, has, I think, front and center. And I think we're going to hear some questions about that. Um, we'll see if voters want to punish the government for the actions of a bunch of male generals and admirals, we'll see. Um, on the We Charity scandal, I think if Canadians ha have felt badly or, or changed their views on the government, the polls on that have already been baked in. That That's already done, and yet we see where Trudeau's at. So, you know, ethics is definitely something the Conservative Party has been very keen to try to hammer uh, the Trudeau government on. And, you know, I, I think, yeah, historically speaking, we can look at when, when liberal governments have fallen, you know, I, I'd say the, the Chrétien government um, or what remained of the Chrétien government, the Martin government essentially, you know, it was ethics. Back then it was sponsorship. Eventually Canadians just went, okay, entitlement and arrogance of these liberals, I'm fed up with them. Are we at that point yet? The Conservatives are definitely going to try to say, yes, we are. They, they're, they're, they're not qualified to be government. These arrogant, uh, entitled liberals. But I'm not so sure voters are yet ready to punish the liberals just on their ethics violations. I think it may be more, you know, on things like I want Pharmacare and this NDP party, for example, is promising Pharmacare. It'll be something along those lines. Uh, I think that's more the mood of voters at this point, rather than punishing liberals for ethics violations, though there's, there's definitely, uh, we're going to hear about ethics during this 36-day uh, campaign. David, let's talk geography. Where does the party need to focus its efforts in the weeks ahead? Where are they at risk to potentially learn see lose seats? That majority has, uh, is, they lost their majority, if you ask me, in Quebec when the Bloc Québécois won 32 seats. Um, they all, almost all of those came at the expense of Liberals. And there's a lot of Liberals. Some are coming back for a second run, some that lost uh, to the Bloc, particularly south of Montreal and north of Montreal. Um, so I think that the, the, there's, there's a, probably a good reason why Trudeau is starting in Montreal uh, today. He'll want to speak to Quebecers uh, today and frequently because he needs to steal some seats from the Bloc, steal them back. That is the first path to his majority. The next jump to his majority, I think, is in B.C. I think that's where the other low-hanging fruit for the Liberals is. Again, there it's likely to be taking seats from Conservative in the lower mainland, a Delta. Um, there is, I'm just trying to think right now, there's a Surrey seat, a Richmond seat uh, held by Alice Wong, a Conservative. The Liberals will be looking at that. So I think Quebec, B.C., but I think there could be an unanticipated bonus for the Liberals, and this could actually fit the scales, believe it or not, in Alberta and Saskatchewan even possibly. And I'll talk about Alberta first. Um, in 2019, the last federal election, Andrew Scheer was campaigning and he was so popular among Albertans, he got 80% of the popular vote. Andrew Scheer's Conservatives won 80% of the popular vote in Alberta in the last election. Well, do you know where Aaron O'Toole has been polling for the last like six months, not just recently, six months, he's polling at 40%. So that's a drop from Scheer's popular support of 80 O'Toole at 40 in Alberta. And where would that support be ebbing away? In Calgary and in Edmonton. I think you'll see Calgary Centre in play, held by, the, held by Conservative. I think a Liberal has a chance there. Calgary Skyview, that's the, air, the riding by the airport. I think Liberals have a chance to win that. Then we move up to Edmonton and we start, it, right now one seat in Edmonton is held by the New Democrats, Edmonton Strathcona. I think the Conservatives could lose Edmonton Griesbach, which is just north of that, held by Conservative Kerry Diot. 
that could go NDP. And now we start to talk about Liberals possibly picking up some other seats in Edmonton, sort of moving uh, towards the southeast. Uh, Edmonton Mill Woods used to be a Marjeet Sohi's riding, a Liberal, um, held now by Tim Upple, a Conservative. Watch that going back to Liberals. So those could, you know, if, they, if the Liberals pick up three or four seats in Alberta, that's a big bonus when they just need to, you know, get 15 or so to get back to majority territory. But the, the, I think the first strategy is got to steal some block seats, got to steal some conservative seats in B.C. and then in Alberta. Now, if I can just go on for a minute, you haven't heard me talk about Ontario. And again, I'm looking at regional polls now versus regional versus the Ontario popular vote in 2019. And again, the polls have been consistent for months. There's not been much change. Aaron O'Toole is doing about as bad or worse as Andrew Scheer was. And, uh, and Justin Trudeau is doing about as bad or good as he was in 2019 in Ontario only. There may be a handful of seats that change hands in Ontario. If there is somebody in Ontario, <clears throat> pardon me, who's doing a bit better, Jagmeet Singh in the NDP. And so you could look at a handful of seats in downtown Toronto. Uh, Parkdale High Park, for example. Davenport, I think, is ripe for the picking. The NDP could take it back from Liberal Julie Zerowitz. Um, possibly Toronto, uh, the, the, the beaches. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's Nate Erskine-Smith. Uh, he's a very progressive Liberal, and I think he's popular probably with the New Democrats. Um, and so there's a few seats in downtown Toronto that the New Democrats could have. I think we go down to Windsor. There's three seats in Windsor. All of them are rematches in terms of New Democrats versus the, the uh, incumbent uh, versus the person they took the seat from. Uh, Windsor-Essex, uh, we see um, uh, Tracy Ramsey, who was an NDP MP. She got beat by Chris Lewis. Tracy is back to try to beat the conservative uh, Chris Lewis. Brian Massey, who's held that seat, Windsor-West, for ages now, a New Democrat. He's going to face the former Ontario Liberal Cabinet Minister, Sandra Pupatello, again. Massey eked out a win against her two, uh, a couple of years ago. He's going to try and do it again. And then Windsor to come to that's the riding north of uh, Windsor. It's another rematch held by Liberal Eric Kushmerschik right now. And, uh, and he's up against the New Democrat he beat in 2019, Cheryl Hardcastle. So uh, New, New, Windsor's actually going to be a little bit of fun. It's three grudge matches, three rematches. And I think two of those, the NDP could win. So that's just some of the seats that I'm keeping an eye on that could change. Liberals, if they want this thing, it's got to be Quebec and BC, a bonus if they get in the West. Aaron O'Toole, well, if he wants to be, he wants to win government, I, I think minority is the only realistic shot that he can possibly think of. And absolutely, they got to do it in Ontario, and that means a GTA. Um, but I just don't see the numbers in any polling for the last six months that shows there's any groundswell towards Aaron O'Toole. I think the GTA voters are still pretty happy with the guy they voted for 2019, and that was Justin Trudeau. David, we're going to keep a close eye on that, and uh, we are expecting the Prime Minister to emerge at some point from behind you. I'm looking at the clock here, 11.05. Yeah, he's uh, been there not, a while now, hasn't he? Yeah, this is not the fastest uh, like visit he, to a Governor General I've seen. He went in at 10.20 Eastern Time, and what are we now? we got to be coming up to 11 o'clock or so, I, I'll bet. We are at 11.05, um, that's a good so long he has chat. been in there 45 minutes. There David, you go. Is, is, that, uh, is that longer than you've seen in your experience covering these events? Yes, it is, as it turns out. I'm, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I didn't think that would be a stat I would need to have had to look up. I, it would have been Stephen Harper would have been the last one, uh, last uh, prime minister in a minority parliament to go to the GG. Don't, I, I don't recall it taking that long. The only time I can recall a GG essentially having a prime minister cool his heels was in, the, um, in 2007, uh, you'll remember, when uh, the opposition parties were going to take the government away from Stephen Harper and Harper wanted to have an emergency prorogation uh, that was pretty clear because he was going to lose a confidence vote. And, uh, and at, at, the, at the time, uh, Mikhail Jean was the, uh, the GG, I think it was Mikhail Jean. Um, she made Harper, when Harper went to ask for a prorogation, which she have to do too with the GG, um, he, she made him wait, sweat maybe. We don't know. We never know what's said. That's the other thing, of course, uh, Professor Legacy can say. That those conversations are forever secret. Um, we, we will never know what Mary Simon and Justin Trudeau are talking about for 45 minutes. Um, but they've been going on for 45 minutes, which seems a little odd to me. I'm certain she's going to say yes. I'm pretty certain that she's going to do it. We <laughs> asked them about that, Mercedes. You'll remember when she got installed, um, when she got installed uh, just a few weeks ago as the governor general, um, that was a question we put to her. I said, did you guys talk about elections and the elections law? And uh, they seemed quite prepared for the answer. The answer was no. That did, never came up 
when Justin Trudeau interviewed Mary Simon to be governor general. So there's a little backstory on that. But yeah, we're, we're mm. this is getting a little long. And we got stuff to do. You got to travel. We got to write reports up. Let's go. Let's get this election on the road. Yeah, the theoretically, I'm supposed to be uh, at Liberal headquarters in under an hour. So uh, my rapid test is awaiting me just outside the studio because we have to take it 45 minutes before we're able to get on. Uh, this will be a very real factor in this election campaign. Add 45 minutes to your day every day because you're going to have to test. And, and, you know, I'll be I'll get to be a little selfish, too. I'm kind of trying to keep an eye on the Nova Scotia election. Remember, voters in Nova Scotia, they have a very real live election going on right now. And I've been helping out our colleagues at Global Halifax. That election concludes on Tuesday. That's when they have their election day on Tuesday, not a Monday. Um, and so that'll be it for them. And it looks to be a much tighter race as we get down to the wire there than we thought at the beginning. At the beginning, the incumbent premier, Ian Rankin, the liberal leader, looked like he had a very comfortable lead, um, but it's getting much, much closer. And Premier Rankin has been hiding from the media. Our colleague Sarah Ritchie of Global Halifax have been uh, tried to chase him down the other day, and they wouldn't let Sarah talk to the Premier. He wasn't doing any press. He was hiding. And today, the Liberal leader in Nova Scotia, Ian Ran Rankin, um, he's actually asked Scott Bryson, the very popular former federal Liberal cabinet minister, uh, to join him on the campaign trail. And why I'm kind of talking about this is because I know that there are Nova Scotia liberals I've talked to. They were very much hoping that Justin Trudeau would also be on the campaign trail coming through Nova Scotia in the final day or two to sort of boost the, the morale of the troops there. Trudeau's much more popular in Nova Scotia than Ian Rankin is. And they were hoping a little Trudeau mania or whatever you want to call it might rub off on Ian Rankin. But right now, the PC leader in Nova Scotia, Tim Houston, um, has made it very much a race, and he could be premier after Tuesday. And again, of some note, Tim Houston, the progressive conservative leader in Nova Scotia, he has taken pains to say, I am not a federal conservative, because the, the, the federal conservative or Western conservative party is not very popular in Nova Scotia. They just have one seat, the federal conservatives do, in Nova Scotia, down there in the, in the southwest, uh, Chris Dontremont, West Nova. Um, and Tim Houston did not want Aaron O'Toole or the federal conservatives to be uh, a will, millstone around his neck. So he's very much campaigned against some of the core tenets of the federal party, notably on debt and deficits. Tim Houston doesn't care about the debt. He wants to spend whatever it takes on health care. Aaron O'Toole, well, you've heard Aaron O'Toole and Pierre Polyev. Oh, my God, inflation's going to kill us if we have these debt and deficits. So, so it's very interesting to watch how things will play in Atlanta, Canada. In Nova Scotia, politics is a bit upside down. <clears throat> the liberals there are arguing for balanced budgets and, and, uh, and fiscal probity, but the PC party there is not. They want to spend, spend, spend on health care. Of course, federally, it's the federal conservatives' debt and deficits, and the liberals are like, nah, well, let's not worry about that. Let's worry about health care and pharmacare. So there you go. Thanks, David. I, I do uh, just want to talk to our producers here for a minute and see if it's possible for us to go to our strategist panel. Uh, I'd like to get them in here while we're waiting uh, for this because it's something actually that one of them just sent me, uh, Greg McEachern, letting me know that the wait for Stephen Harper when he went in was two hours long. So this wait with Mary Simon is in fact um, longer than we were expecting it perhaps to be. Uh, I'm sure she's got some pretty tough questions there. Um, this is a pandemic election and Mary Simon doesn't strike me as the kind of governor general who doesn't ask some tough questions. She will do, uh, I expect, what she is constitutionally, by constitutional experts tell us she's expected likely to do. Um, but I don't think this would just be someone who would say, yeah, sure, go for it. I think there's going to be some questions about how hard have you tried to work. Of course, none of us are a fly on the wall. Don't we all wish that we were? We're not. Let's take a look at what some of the key issues might be with our strategist now. Greg, you just sent me that note saying two hours for Stephen Harper. Uh, what do you make of the length of time here with this governor general? And of course, a very important note, Canada's very first Indigenous governor general. I, I think with um, the previous time with Mikhail Jean keeping Stephen Harper waiting, that was a surprise. Um, as evidence, if my memory is correct, uh, Prime Minister Harper had an event at a car uh, manufacturing plant in southwestern Ontario later that day that he didn't make. I am not surprised that the Governor General, uh, th this is going to be a longer meeting. Um, part of it is I think there, there's a need to rebuild some trust into in the institution of Governor General in Canada after Governor General Payette. 
Um, the other thing I should add, uh, just as a disclosure, in a previous life, I worked for uh, Mary Simon when she was president of the National Inuit Association, ITK. And you're right, Mercedes, she probably is asking the prime minister some tough questions. But this is not, it should not be treated uh, as a check mark. I mean, we, we don't want to go back into King Bing and there is a, you know, democratically elected prime minister versus a, an appointed governor general. But still, this is part of our, our constitutional uh, approach. It is a check and a balance. I think it's really important. Um, granted as well, it is early days for this governor general and this prime minister, although I'm sure that, that they've known each other previously. Um, I do think that this process uh, is important and I'm not surprised that it is not a, uh, being treated as a, a Tim Hortons drive through trip to Rideau Hall. Uh, and just to note there that uh, the 2008 request was a prorogation request. It wasn't the dissolution, I believe, that took two hours. That's obviously different um, than making the decision to go to a general election campaign. Kate, uh, when we look at Aaron O'Toole here, what does he have to do to establish name brand recognition? I hear a lot of folks anecdotally when I talk to them say, yeah, yeah, whatever, he's another Andrew Scheer. Um, he actually is a very different leader than Andrew Scheer. He's a different person, very different life experience, different policies, different views. Uh, we were talking before about how he was largely seen as a red Tory and that was seen as a bad thing during the conservative leadership race, but could serve him well here if he's able to actually translate that to convince perhaps some centrist or right leaning liberals to consider him. How does Aaron O'Toole manage to get that name brand recognition and for him to be seen as not, you know, uh, the way that Andrew Scheer was another iteration of Stephen Harper? Yeah, it is definitely a challenge when we are in a pandemic environment and a lot of those interactions Mercedes are happening digitally and virtually. Uh, O'Toole has the benefit of coming from the conservative leadership race, which was also fought very much on a, a digital grounds. Uh, there wasn't the typical traditional campaigning that ha happened there. Uh, and that actually was one of the things that I think uh, led to O'Toole's success during the leadership campaign was the use of digital and virtual technology in order to connect with voters. So he does have that uh, that background. He's got a pretty slick setup um, in terms of, of his events. So I think that that uh, prior uh, prior work will definitely help him. Uh, really, in terms of differentiating from leaders past, though, I think uh, the focus needs to be on policy and on ideas. Uh, and one thing that conservatives have struggled with in the past, uh, including under Stephen Harper, is in putting forward uh, a message of optimism and one of hope. Uh, I mentioned earlier the anxiety a lot of Canadians feel right now in this moment. Uh, I think it's really important for conservatives to start talking about uh, what they would do uh, to try and manage the pandemic moving forward, but also what Canada would look like under their leadership. More and more voters are looking uh, to align their votes with values. And I think for the Conservatives, it's really important that there be uh, an ambition that's communicated there. Forget about uh, your dislike of Justin Trudeau, because like it or not, a lot of Canadians still like the guy, even if Conservatives don't. Okay. doesn't mean you I'm can't be critical, but it needs to be more focused on what they would do. I'm just going to jump in there because we're expecting the Prime Minister any moment. And uh, Dananjay, we missed you last time too. So let's go to you. Your thoughts before the Prime Minister walks out those doors and kicks this off. Well, I think uh, Canadians have seen that uh, both the Liberals and the Tories have, haven't really cared about Canadians during this pandemic. It's been the NDP that's been doing the heavy lifting. Um, Jigmeet Singh's been out there pushing the Liberal government to actually implement, uh, whether it was doubling of CERB, whether it was the uh, Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. And I think Canadians are going to be uh, really excited about the platform that we have to offer in this campaign. Okay, and I'm hearing he's on his way, and there he is. We're watching him come out. Here comes Justin Trudeau. At the moment, still Prime Minister. I suspect he's about to become the Liberal leader as he announces the result of his meeting with the Governor General, Mary Simon. Good morning. I want to begin today by addressing the unfolding events in Afghanistan. We've been constantly monitoring the rapidly evolving situation. And I've been briefed by officials earlier this morning to get the latest developments on the ground. As always, the safety and security of Canadian personnel is our top priority. The current situation poses serious challenges to our ability to ensure that safety and security of our mission. So as of this morning, Canadian diplomatic personnel are on their way back to Canada. We thank them for their tireless efforts to help the people of Afghanistan in their pursuit of democracy, human rights, education, 
health and security. Our commitment to the people of Afghanistan, including women and girls and the LGBTQ2 communities, remains unwavering. And we will honor the sacrifices of Canadians, our armed forces, diplomats, journalists, and civil society have made over the past years. Our government has also committed to resettling up to 20,000 Afghans through the ongoing Special Immigration Measures Program. Our ongoing work to bring Afghans to safety in Canada under SIMS remains a top priority, and we will continue to work in close collaboration with partners and allies on this commitment. Ministers Garno, Sajjan, and Mendicino will be continuing this work throughout the coming weeks. Canada firmly condemns the escalating violence, and we are heartbroken at the situation the Afghan people find themselves in today. This is especially so given the sacrifices of Canadians who believed and continue to believe in the future of Afghanistan. We will continue to work with allies and the international community to ensure that those efforts were not in vain. We are committed to Afghanistan and to the Afghan people. Merci de vous joindre à nous ici à Rideau Hall aujourd'hui. Thank you for being with us at Rideau Je me suis entretenu avec son excellence, la gouverneure générale. Et elle a accepté General, ma demande de dissoudre le Parlement. Parliament. Les Canadiens iront donc aux Canadians will le be going septembre. to their polls on September 20th. My friends, it's been a big couple of years. The last 17 months have been like nothing we've ever experienced. And we're all wondering what the next 17 months, not to mention the next 17 years, will hold. A global pandemic, a global recession, a global climate crisis that's causing wildfires and flooding around the world. You're probably wondering what this means for you, for your job, for your kids, for your retirement, for your community, and for your country. Well, that's fair. But just look at what Canadians did in this time of crisis, in this time of uncertainty. When this pandemic struck, Canadians dug deep. You put on your mask to keep your neighbors safe. You followed public health rules, stayed home, and supported our frontline workers. And you rolled up your sleeves to lead the world on vaccinations. No one expected this crisis, but time and time again, community after community, you showed what metal we're made of as Canadians. So don't stop now. If you haven't already, go get vaccinated. And if you have, talk to the person you know who still needs to get their shot. They won't necessarily be easy conversations, but they're important to have. We owe it to each other. Because with our actions, we show what it means to be Canadian. And now more than ever, that matters. Look, COVID-19 wasn't something we expected as a government either. But just like you, we knew that staying true to who we are and what we believe in was the only path forward. So from day one, we focused on having your back because that's what we stood for, because that's what we've always stood for. That's why we came to Ottawa in the first place, to build a government that would stand up for the middle class and people working hard to join it. That was the real change we delivered over the first six years. In fact, the very first thing we did was to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could lower them for the middle class. It's the real change we delivered by lifting hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty with the Canada Child ben Benefit. Real change by delivering clean drinking water to thousands of Indigenous people in over 100 communities. By building and refurbishing almost 200 schools so far, 
so that tens of thousands of Indigenous kids have a better chance. It's a real change we delivered by pushing hard so that everywhere in the country there is a price on pollution and then standing firm so that in no province is it free to pollute anymore. And those are the values that drove us to deliver the CERB and the wage subsidy to make sure that Canadians could get through this crisis too. On a choisi d'être là pour les familles et les travailleurs. We chose to be there for families and workers with CERB and the wage subsidy. We supported small businesses with loans and help with their rent. What we knew in 2015, and which is even clearer now, is that our future depends on you. And we've always stood for you. And now it's time to hear your voice. The decisions your government makes right now will define the future your kids and grandkids grow up in. So in this pivotal, consequential moment, who wouldn't want a say? Who wouldn't want their chance to help decide where our country goes from here? Canadians need to choose how we finish the fight against COVID-19 and build back better from getting the job done on vaccines to having people's backs all the way to and through the end of this crisis. For example, as a government, we chose to make sure that federal public servants and everyone boarding a train or a plane be vaccinated. Not everyone agrees. Not every political party agrees. Well, Canadians should be able to weigh in on that and on so much more. We believe that a government's most important responsibility is to keep Canadians safe and thriving, and that's what we'll continue to do. On était là pour vous, et maintenant, been there for you, à vous de choisir. and now it's up to you to choose. It's up to you to express yourself. The decisions your government is making now will define the future in which your children and grandchildren will grow up. We are experiencing a historic moment, and you have something to say about it. You have the right to choose the future of our country, whether it's to pursue our vaccination efforts or to support people until the end of this crisis. All Canadians should choose how our fight against COVID-19 will end and how we will rebuild back better. For instance, as a government, we've decided to ensure that public service and anyone who takes a train or a plane needs to be vaccinated. Not everybody agrees with this, and not all parties agree with this. So, Canadians should be able to express their point of view. We believe that the most important responsibility a government has is to ensure that Canadians can thrive in a safe environment, and that's precisely what we'll continue to do. I don't accept any party saying we shouldn't do everything we can to keep people safe and to end this pandemic and rebuild. And I certainly don't accept any politician saying you shouldn't have your choice on how to do that or on what comes next. Because as much as we've done over the past many, many months, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. We think families looking for childcare should get that now. We think workers deserve good middle-class jobs now. We think more ambition on climate change is needed now. That's what we think. So what do you think? You deserve a say, because this is your moment. C'est le moment dès maintenant. The time has come to fight even harder for a safe and healthy Canada. The time has come to be more ambitious to create affordable housing and work harder on reconciliation, to be bolder in protecting the environment and growing our economy. My friends, this is the choice you have during this election. To elders and long-term care homes and people who've worked hard for a good retirement but are struggling, I hear you. 
when you say you deserve better. We're ready to make sure you get it. To parents thinking about how it just keeps getting more expensive to raise a family. To young people worried about how to afford a home. You're right. It is tough. Indeed, it's unacceptable. So we're going to continue investing in housing and we're going to keep making life more affordable. To students raising your voices on the climate crisis, yes, I'm right there with you. This is a crisis. And yes, we're banning single-use plastics, and yes, we've won the fight for a price on pollution right across this country, but yes, that's not enough. Our planet and our future are at stake. So I need you alongside me in this fight, because together we can do so much more than we can apart. And to kids, you've missed birthdays and school days. This pandemic has hit you hard, and you stepped up to help your moms and dads, to help your community. And now we need to step up to make sure that you're safe, to make sure we're building you the best possible future. Real solutions to the real problems we face. A better, stronger Canada for everyone. That is your future to choose, and this is your time to choose it. In this important moment, maybe the most important since 19, 1945, and certainly in most of our lifetimes, who thinks Canadians shouldn't have a say? After making it through 17 months of nothing like we've ever experienced, Canadians deserve to choose what the next 17 months, what the next 17 years and beyond will look like. And I know that we have the right plan, the right team, and the proven leadership to meet that moment. So to the other parties, please explain why you don't think Canadians should have the choice, why you don't think that this is a pivotal moment. Because I'm focused on our real plan. I'm focused on the path forward with Canadians. So to Canadians, I'm asking you to vote for real, progressive leadership, for strong health care, for affordable homes, for a clean and protected environment. Make your voice heard, have your say, and together, let's move forward for everyone. I'm asking you to support a progressive and bold government, a strong health care system, affordable housing, a protected environment. Have your say and let's move forward together. I want to thank the media for being here today and over to you for questions. Thank you, Prime Minister. 20 minutes of questions, starting with the Toronto Star. Uh, you didn't use the word majority, but I know you would like a majority to enact that plan. Uh, however, the NDP says you have the confidence of Parliament. They'd support you in um, any of these measures that you talk about and all of these ambitions. So how can you justify to Canadians the need for an election that will cost $500 million in the middle of a fourth wave when you said to Canadians you would not go to the polls before the end of the pandemic? This is a really important moment in Canada's history. For the past two years, for the past 17 months specifically of the pandemic, we've been making really big, really consequential decisions. And in the last election, nobody was talking about what we might do in a pandemic. So the government and indeed Parliament needs an opportunity to get a mandate from Canadians to hear from Canadians on how to end this pandemic, how to build back better in really meaningful ways. As Canadians know, this is a moment where we're going to be taking decisions that will last not just for the coming months, but for the coming decades. And Canadians deserve their say. That's exactly what we're going to give them. 
Je pense que tout le monde comprend qu'on est dans un moment extrêmement important dans notre histoire en tant que pays. Point of our history as a country. Années, les, the past mois, 17 months ont vu des décisions énormes have meant par le Parlement, important decisions par le made by Parliament and the government of the LA. Not only to pour jeter les bases face this pandemic, but also juste, to have a more tous. just, more fair, and en more prosperous society for all by building back Et je pense que better. And I think it's important for Canadians to be heard on how they want this pandemic to end, how we will build back better. We are in a point in time where more and more Canadians have been vaccinated. This pandemic is not yet behind us. And Canadians deserve their say in the coming months and the coming decades. What do you say to people who think that in gambling like this in the middle of a public health crisis, that if you don't get a majority, you should resign your political futures at stake? Will you resign? I think Canadians know that our democracy is strong. I think Canadians know uh, that we are coming through this pandemic, that it's not over yet and people need to continue uh, to step up and get vaccinated to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. And that's certainly something I'm going to keep reminding people about every single day over the coming weeks. That people need to continue to do their part, protect their communities, protect each other, protect our kids who can't yet get vaccinated because they're under 12. I think this is a moment uh, where Canadians can and should be able to weigh in on what we're going through and on how we're going to build a society that is stronger and better and learns from uh, the challenges we've all experienced and the sacrifices we've all made uh, through the worst of this pandemic. The pandemic is not over and we're going to be taking consequential decisions on how we finish with this pandemic. And I think it's Canadians' right to weigh in on that. Next question. Good morning, Prime Minister. Ashley Burke, CBC News. Sorry, Mr. Trudeau. Um, during the last sitting of Parliament, you managed to survive the throne speech. You managed to, get, managed to get your budget passed, as well as get legislation through. Can you tell Canadians what your thinking is, why you need to have an election now in order to continue to govern, and provide some concrete examples of what you feel the, the opposition has prevented you from accomplishing? I think all Canadians get that this is a historic moment we are living through. Government and indeed Parliament has enacted significant measures to support Canadians through an unprecedented crisis. And we've done it in a way that met the urgency and the intensity of what we all went through over the past many, many months. But we're at a moment now when many, many Canadians are vaccinated, many more are continuing to get vaccinated, where I think it's right for Canadians to be able to pronounce themselves on where we're going, on how we get through this, on what the next steps are for fighting the pandemic as we face a fourth wave, but also what the next steps are for rebuilding our communities, our society, our country, so that it is better and more resilient for years to come. Canadians need to have their say. Nobody asked anyone how they thought we should manage a pandemic in the 2019 election. And together, Parliament and indeed Canadians have done incredibly well. We are leading the world on vaccinations. We've stepped up to protect our loved ones and Canadians are continuing to step up. But it's time we had a national conversation, a national direction on those next steps. And that's exactly what we're going to be able to do over the next six weeks. Following up? Or however many weeks there are. Can you also explain to Canadians who are tuning in why you are calling this election now when there are thousands of people in Afghanistan who you've promised to help, who are in, in a severe danger of being captured or killed, and, and you're doing this on a day when you've just announced that the embassy is closing? 
again, um, we are extremely concerned about the situation in Afghanistan, and I can assure you uh, that officials and indeed ministers continue and will continue to weigh in on protecting Canadians, getting Canadians uh, safely out of Afghanistan, and continuing to step up, as Canada has so many times around the world, to bring people to safety. We will be accepting in 20,000 Afghans into Canada, and that means once again, as Canadians have so many times, they get to step up and welcome people into their homes, into their communities, who are fleeing horrific violence, building a better life for themselves, for their families, and through that work, building a better life for all Canadians. It's something that we've done. It's something we're going to continue to do. And our democracy and our democ democratic institutions are strong enough to be able to ensure that even as we do this important work for Afghanistan, we're able to check in and make sure that Canadians have their voice on the extraordinarily pressing issues facing them here in this country right now and for the coming years. We remain extremely concerned by the situation in Afghanistan. For years, Canada has committed to improve future of the Afghan people. And it's with extreme sadness that we are witnessing what's happening in Afghanistan today. And I can guarantee that our diplomats, our public service, and our ministers, as well as myself, and in fact, I've just been briefed on the current state of affairs today on the ground. We will continue to carry out the important work of bringing back all Canadians to Canada, but also ensuring that uh, we take in 20,000 Afghanis and their, and their families in the months to come. But our democracy is sufficiently robust and our systems are strong enough that as we are doing that, we can also give Canadians an opportunity to weigh in on how we should carry on our work to see this pandemic to an end and to build back better for the years and decades to come because we are at a pivotal moment in our history. Good Thank morning, you. Next Prime question. Minister Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. Can you please clarify what the government will still do for the former interpreters and other embassy staff who are Afghans who are still in Afghanistan? Will those people still be brought back to Canada and how? The security situation on the ground is uh, extremely uh, fast evolving. Uh, we are uh, in close contact with our allies, uh, with the Americans who have uh, increased their pre troop presence on the ground to secure uh, the airport and the green zone in Afghanistan, in, in around Kabul. Uh, we will continue uh, to work uh, to get as many uh, Afghan interpreters and their families out as quickly as possible, as long as the security uh, situation holds. And we will continue to work over the coming months. Uh, to resettle refugees uh, who uh, will flee Afghanistan, who will look uh, to come to start new lives in Canada. Uh, we've talked about 20,000 of them, and that's uh, something that we're able to do because Canadians will once again open their homes, their communities, and their hearts to people fleeing from violence uh, in far-off parts of the world. At the same time, I want to take a moment uh, to thank all the members of the Canadian Armed Forces, past and present. Uh, those who uh, fought so incredibly bravely and saw uh, fellow CAF members fall by the wayside and for our years of engagement in Afghanistan, but also those who are on the ground right now, continuing to work to support the people who've supported Canadians in our time there, continue to be there as we speak, working to get as many people out to safety as possible. Our Canadian Armed Forces do an extraordinary job in stepping up, in being there to promote Canadian values, to help people around the world, 
and today, like every day, they re deserve our recognition and thanks. Following up? Our reporters, uh, not just with The Globe, but from many media outlets, are being flooded with calls from former interpreters and their family in tears, fearing for their life. Meantime, the embassy in Canada is, has been evacuated and your government says they're on their way home. So how will you bring these people home and when will that happen? We continue to work to process and support uh, people seeking to flee Afghanistan and come to Canada in safety. Obviously, uh, the uh, security situation is extremely concerning on the ground and the protection of uh, Canadians and our armed forces are top of mind. But we continue to do the work on uh, allowing and enabling uh, people who've been there for Canadians, whether it's interpreters or drivers or security or whatever, uh, to make sure that they're coming to safety. There are also human rights activists and uh, civil society leaders, uh, journalists uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, community leaders who we are working with to try and make sure uh, that we are offering them uh, the safety and the future that they deserve. Prochaine question. Bonjour, Raymond Fillion de TVA. Raymond Fillion, TVA. Mr. Trudeau, many Canadians this morning will wonder if it's uh, responsible for the leader of government to be away, to be on the road for five or six weeks as we begin the fourth wave. Is it responsible? I think it's really important to offer Canadians in this very important moment a choice so that they may win, weigh in on how we will continue to battle this pandemic, which as I said is not over yet. A point in time when most Canadians are vaccinated and others continue to become vaccinated and I should say that every day of this campaign I will be there to encourage people and ask people who have not been vaccinated to get the job, the jab rather. And I think it will be important in moment when choices that we make as governments and parliaments have a direct impact on people's lives throughout this crisis, but also in years to come. I think it's really important to ask Canadians to weigh in, give them an opportunity to be heard on how we should move through the rest of this pandemic. A pandemic that was not at all on the horizon in the last election in 2019, we didn't know, we couldn't have predicted, predicted it was coming. I think uh, we did an extraordinary job in terms of vaccines, rolling out the vaccination campaign, but I think it's also very important that Canadians have the opportunity to weigh in on how to see us through the rest of the pandemic and build back better. Why not wait a few more months until the crisis behind us? And also, to come back to the question you didn't answer, if you don't get the majority you're looking for, will you resign? It's really important, from my point of view, to underscore how much our situation has improved thanks to the efforts Canadians have made. Our healthcare workers, our frontline workers who did an extraordinary job to see us through this pandemic and keep us safe, but also Canadians who sacrificed a great deal by staying home, by supporting one another, and also, and mainly, by getting the jab in record amounts. We are leading the world on vaccinations. Barbecuing together, we are going into shops, things are becoming a little bit more normal despite this fourth wave. But I think people understand that our institutions and our democracy are sufficiently robust to work even in difficult times. And in difficult times, when decisions made by parliament and government will have a tremendous impact on people's lives in the coming months and years, it's important that Canadians have a say.
Bonjour, M. Trudeau, Catherine Lévesque, La Presse canadienne. Catherine Lévesque, Canadian Press. I'm asking the question for the third time. If you end up with a minority government, will you resign? Nous sommes dans un moment we have come to a point in time when Canadians deserve to be heard so they can let us know how we should fight this pandemic and especially how we will build back better. And I've unveiled over the past years my values, my point of view on how we should build back better. And I've shown that I have the team plan to improve the lives of millions of Canadians who are worried, no doubt, but understand that the choices we are being made that are being made are essential. Canadians deserve their say on what mandate Parliament and government should have. My job and my commitment to Canadians is that I will continue to be there for them, to support Canadians. I've said it from the beginning, as long as it takes, with all it takes. You didn't quite answer my question, but I'll move on to the next one. In 2019, you began your campaign in, in BC. You'll be starting this campaign in Quebec. I'm wondering what will Quebec's importance be during this campaign? And do you expect a, a majority, thanks to the fact that you'll be hitting the hustings in Quebec? Well, I began the campaign last time in uh, BC. I'll be going home to Montreal this afternoon. BC feels like home as well. The impact isn't felt based on what we do every day, but rather how Canadians see what we do every day, how we will continue to fight the pandemic, how we'll build back better. And in all corners of this country, there will be varied concerns. Therefore, I feel that during this election, we'll have the opportunity to hear Canadians' concerns, to hear their point of view. And of course, Quebec is important for me as a Quebecer myself, but the entire country is important because we worked together with the premiers throughout this pandemic like never before. We collaborated on, on child care, on support during the pandemic for small businesses, for individuals, on fighting climate change. We've always been there to work with all Canadians throughout the country and will continue to do so. Mia Rabson from the Canadian Press. You've had a lot of announcements in the last couple of weeks, even this morning, new child care agreements, long-term care agreements with provinces. You're insisting that you need an election to go to the people to get a mandate, but you're doing all of these things. You didn't wait for an election. So if you can do all of those things without an election, why do you need a mandate f further? This is about giving Canadians an opportunity to weigh in at a really pivotal time. Yes, you talk about the child care agreements that we've signed with uh, eight different provinces and territories and are going to ensure that millions upon millions of Canadians have access to affordable child care. Well, this is something that we talked about in the 2019 election. Talked about it again in the uh, 2021 budget. And we're moving forward on that. But there are many things in regards to ending this pandemic, in regards to building back better, that we didn't talk about two years ago in the 2019 election, that I think Canadians have a right to weigh in on. We've seen situations where uh, conservative backbenchers have referred to some of this government's decisions as tyrannical in terms of how we're uh, make, creating mandates for vaccination of public servants or vaccination of people on trains and airplanes. Well, the answer to tyranny is to have an election. And I think people who disagree uh, with this government or disagree with this direction uh, should have an opportunity to make themselves heard. And that's what this election is all about. It's allowing Canadians to weigh in. It's allowing Canadians to be heard, allowing Canadians to, in this moment where we are uh, so strongly vaccinated and looking towards the future, not just the end of this pandemic, but how we build back better, 
looking for an opportunity to make sure the decisions being taken in Parliament and by government are reflected, are reflective of the hopes and dreams of Canadians. I'm also curious, with the fourth wave in Canada clearly uh, underway and there's risks of having a pandemic election, what do you think those biggest risks are and is that worth it to you? I think obviously uh, with the rise in numbers, uh, uh, case numbers amongst the unvaccinated, uh, that does represent a risk. And that's why it's going to be so important that we continue, all parties, to encourage uh, everyone across this country to continue to get vaccinated. If you haven't gotten your first dose yet, get your, your first dose. If you're waiting for your second dose, book it now. We need to make sure that as many Canadians as possible are protected against this disease. Because there are Canadians, kids under 12, uh, immunocompromised Canadians who for medical reasons can't get protected, who are going to be relying on everyone else who can get vaccinated to get vaccinated to keep them safe. My kids uh, have to get tested and show vaccinations uh, before they go to summer camp, the older ones. We're expecting kids to be vaccinated in many different situations and they're stepping up for that. I think it's the least adults can do to step up and get vaccinated to protect those kids who can't get vaccinated yet. And that's the message we're going to keep pushing out there. That people need to continue to get vaccinated and we're going to keep moving forward on measures that both encourage people to get vaccinated but also make it more difficult for unvaccinated people to spread the disease to others. This is an important principle that this government is taking and it's certainly something that, amongst others, Canadians have a right to weigh in on, and that's what this election will be about. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Bonjour, Julianne Lapointe de Radio Canada. Mr. Trudeau, vous dites vouloir entendre le choix des Canadiens. Mr. Trudeau, you say you want to hear Canadians express their choice, but many Canadians have said they don't want an election. What do you say to people that feel that public funds shouldn't be used for an election campaign when they had to tighten their belt for months? I think people understand that we are not living normal times. This is a crisis. There is a pandemic. We're thinking about how we could build our society back in a better fashion. We have a government and a parliament that have taken important decisions over the past 17 months that will have an impact on Canadians' lives for years to come. I think we've come to a point in time when Canadians deserve to be heard, deserve to have a say, to decide how we should move through the end of this pandemic and the coming years, how we can build back better. That's democracy. It provides Canadians the opportunity to be heard and to choose the direction of government and parliament. And therefore, Canadians will have an opportunity and should have an opportunity to be heard during this election on the pandemic and the future. I know that millions of Canadians throughout this country want to be heard, want to have a say on decisions we are making, on choices we'll be making in the months and years to come. And this election is their opportunity to do so. A new government means a period of adjustment, new MPs, people who will have to learn the ropes. So how will you be able to hit the ground running, given that uh, the fourth wave at that point after the elections could have hit the country hard? Firstly, the government's job to continue to protect Canadians carries on throughout this pandemic. We will continue to do the next necessary work with respect to Afghanistan, Haiti, where once again there has been a horrible earthquake that breaks our hearts. The government and our partners in the provinces will continue to do this work to keep Canadians safe in the weeks to come. We 
accueillir avec grand enthousiasme sure les nouveaux that... députés. New MPs are greeted with enthusiasm. Ottawa, They'll be sent to Et Ottawa by local voters. And I'm sure that Canadians relish this opportunity to choose a representative, qui sera dans ce a person qui va who will represent their future, somebody who will take very important pays. decisions for our country. I think it's a pivotal moment for all Canadians. And I can't wait to show our vision and to share with Canadians my optimism for this country together. I think one of the things we know is that even while there's an election going on, the work of our government continues whether it's dealing with Afghanistan or dealing with the heartbreak of yet another uh, terrible earthquake in Haiti, or whether it's uh, continuing to do the necessary work to keep Canadians safe through this pandemic and work uh, with our partners across all the provinces who are themselves working very hard on dealing with this fourth wave amongst unvaccinated people. Our institutions are strong. The opportunity we have right now for Canadians to make themselves heard and to send, in many cases, new representatives to Ottawa to be their voices, voices for their communities in Ottawa, to be able to have their choices resonate, not just through the end of this pandemic, but into the coming years and decades as we build back better. This is a moment in which Canadians deserve to have their voices heard. Canadians deserve to make their choices. And like I said, I'll leave it for the others to explain why they don't think Canadians should get to weigh in in this extraordinarily consequential historic moment. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse d'aujourd'hui. This is Valen, City's Presser. Merci tout le monde. There we go. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau launching the beginning of the 2021 election. From now on, he will be the Liberal leader and not referred to as the Prime Minister as we head out on the campaign. David Aiken there at Rideau Hall. David, what stood out to you about the Prime Minister's comments? Well, I thought it was, uh, I'll give him credit for a creative ap approach to the inevitable why now question. He got it several times from reporters. He addressed it in his, in his prepared remarks, why now? And the Liberal response is, why not now? Um, I'm not so sure that's the most convincing of responses, but he certainly stuck with it. Um, why not now? We deserve choices. Well, of course, Canadians made a choice in 2019, and uh, that choice is sort of still in effect. But in any event, uh, away he goes with that one. I was listening hard, too, though, for a ballot question, for a promise saying, re-elect us because we will do X, or because we're unable to do X. Uh, in the current parliament. And I really didn't hear one. If, if there was anything close to it, it was, uh, we believe in mandatory vaccinations for federal civil servants, mandatory vaccinations if you want to get on a, a, um, a train or a plane, and some other parties may not believe in that. I think he's referring uh, to the conservatives. I know the, the NDP do believe in uh, mandatory vaccinations in certain circumstances. So maybe that's the ballot question. Is it going to be a mandatory vaccines? But you'll also remember, too, that he was asked, you know, you sketch out some broad priorities. I mean, they want to work on climate change, lower the cost of housing, continue working on child care. Again, broad priorities. But is there anything in the current minority parliament that just got dissolved that was preventing the Trudeau government, the minority government, from doing any work on those things? Well, of course it wasn't. Um, the, the Trudeau minority government has been supported most often by the NDP in that minority, sometimes by the Bloc Québécois. They've got budgets done. They've got speeches from the throne done. Uh, they've been able to govern. There's been, if there's been anything in their way, it's been the unelected Senate that Trudeau appointed all these unelected senators who all of a sudden decided to exercise their power. So um, we'll see. I think the, the challenge now for the Liberals will be to sketch out some very specific things that they now want to accomplish if they have a majority. But again, they have to explain, well, you could have done those with a minority. So um, we'll see where things go. And Mercedes, I was talking before the, the, the speech that um, at the end of the day, uh, John Horgan was asked the same thing when he took British Columbians to the polls in a snap election. Um, he had a minority and he got asked, why now? It's a pandemic. And he won a majority. 
Blaine Higgs was the incumbent premier, uh, progressive conservative New Brunswick. He went to the polls in the midst of an, an election, snap election, and he went from a minority to a majority. And I suspect right now Justin Trudeau is hoping for a three-peat on that count. And very interesting question you raised there, David, that uh, a lot of us are talking about. I saw our national anchor, Donna Friesen, tweeting about it, talking about, uh, you know, if, if the prime minister is so confident in the choices that he has made in this government and they've done so well and been so smart and managed to get the endorsement of the opposition and taken the opposition into account and negotiated, then why the need to seek a mandate from Canadians when uh, the Canadian system is, in fact, designed to govern uh, with more than one party when necessary. And he says, so why I, not seek a mandate? Yeah. Why not if you might get a majority? At the end of the day, they're politicians, so we're not surprised when they do political things. They are political animals, uh, but certainly still a question there. Well, for well the and that's the other thing, Mercedes, you'll notice. He, I don't think he used the word majority anywhere. I, I look at the transcript. I was trying to listen for, in a majority, we can do X, or majority. I didn't. He didn't go anywhere near that word. Um, I, I don't think in either French or English. So, um, you know, though we got asked about it. So he's trying to trying to look very magnanimous. So it's a choice. We, we, we believe in Canadians having choices. That's why now. OK, let's see what Canadians think. We'll find out. David, thank you so much for joining us. I want to go quickly to our panel before we go to Aaron O'Toole, who's expected to speak momentarily. Uh, Dinesh, we've tried to, to get your uh, response here a couple of times. I want to give you a chance first then to respond to the Prime Minister and, and what you heard there in the address today. I appreciate that, Mercedes. In the last segment, I, could, I saw the doors open and I could see him walking out. So I was like, oh, I should probably cut that short. Um, you know, it... it I'm sorry, it came across as incredibly disingenuous. Um, you know, Justin Trudeau kept talking about a mandate, but there's not a single piece of legislation that he wanted to pass but couldn't. Uh, in fact, he was asked to provide a single example and, and he couldn't provide a single example. He kept talking about a choice, but in May of this year, um, he said clearly that there was no election, that he didn't want to have an election under, the, under a pandemic. The only thing that's changed since May is that the polling has gotten better for him. Um, and that he thinks he can do this power grab. It's it's a selfish election. Um, he's putting his own job in front of public health. And I mean, he you know he himself admitted in the speech that we're still in the middle of this pandemic. But uh, if it's an election he wants, you know, Jigmeet Singh and the NDP were ready to fight for working people. Um, we're ready to make the ultra rich and big corporations pay uh, their fair share. Uh, and Canadians are ready for better. So. Uh, I think I think okay. if there's anything that comes out of this election, I, I'm um, sorry, I'm going to step in there yet again. I'm sorry to do this to you. We now have Aaron O'Toole up. So if we can go and hear the conservative leader, Aaron O'Toole, addressing Canadians as this election Finally, launches. Point, thanks to the efforts of all Canadians who have stayed at home, got tested, got vaccinated, where we can see our loved ones, our friends and our families again. We shouldn't be risking that for political games or political gain. La dernière année a été difficile pour tout le monde. Partout au pays, this des familles past year ont has been difficult for everyone. People have lost loved, one, loved ones, workers have lost their jobs, and prices are increasing. Canadians have sacrificed a lot. They stayed home, they were tested, and they got a vaccine. And it's born fruit because we can now see our loved ones, our friends, and our families. But we cannot waste our efforts for political gains. A leader who cared about the best interests of Canadians would be straining every sinew to secure the recovery right now. Instead, Justin Trudeau has called an election. That's Justin Trudeau's choice. And I hope that his decision doesn't cost Canadians too dearly. My wife, Rebecca, and I had COVID-19. We know the fears and uncertainties that are out there. But let's be clear. This election is not about the next week, the next month, or even the next year. It's about the next four years. It's about who will deliver the economic recovery Canada needs. It's about who will take action to protect Canadians from spiraling living costs, from rising taxes, from poorer services. 
For the past six years, we've been promised solutions, and year after year after year, Justin Trudeau has let the Canadian people down. The result? Hard-pressed families struggling to pay bills and worried about the cost of food, of housing, of heating. And the Liberal Party's answer? To ask you to reward them with another four years of majority government for doing the bare minimum. Another four years of broken promises and of letting Canadians down. And the NDP, Greens and Bloc Québécois, they support spending other people's money as much as the Liberals. They're all the same. Depuis six ans, on nous promet des solutions. six years, we've année been promised année, solutions. Justin and Trudeau year after year, Justin Trudeau has let us down. Families are hard-pressed to find a way to pay their bills. People are worried about the cost of food, housing and heating. The Liberal Party's answer? They're asking you to reward them with an extra four years. Four extra years of broken promises, of doing the bare minimum and letting Canadians down. The Bloc, the Greens and the NDP, just like the Liberals, want to spend your money. They're all the same. Business as usual isn't enough. Canadians need more. Canada needs more. We need a strong economy to support high wages for workers and great infrastructure. We need a strong economy so that today's Canadians can have confidence that tomorrow will be brighter for the next generation. Canadians deserve to know what their politicians will deliver. They deserve to know that there's a plan and they deserve a government that will keep its word. 12 years in the military have taught me to always have a plan. Canada's recovery plan will unite our country and secure the future. I am a new Conservative leader with a proven track record and a fresh approach. It's Canada's recovery plan to get our economy firing on all cylinders and to get our public finances under control. It's our plan to secure one million jobs, tough new anti-corruption laws, mental health action, securing Canadian-made medical supplies, balancing the budget. The 12 years I spent in the military taught me to always have a plan. And that's what we'll do with Canada's recovery plan. A recovery plan that will help us kickstart the economy and better manage our public money. It's our plan to act to get one million new jobs, new anti-corruption laws, action for mental health, medical supplies made in Canada, a balanced budget, and solutions. The alternative is Justin Trudeau's entitled government borrowing $424 million a day, racking up $1.4 trillion of debt that he's going to ask you and your children to pay back. We can't afford more of the same. We can't afford more borrowing and higher costs of living while Justin hands out contracts to his friends. Conservatives will stand up for hardworking Canadians and their families. We'll work for you, not a small group of people in Ottawa who help themselves, lobbyists, donors, and friends of the Liberal Party. We'll work relentlessly to make sure that for generations to come, Canadians can grow up with world-class services, a healthy economy, and healthy finances. Canada is a country where politicians must earn trust, not one where you're born into power and can take it for granted. Our team is ready to get to work, to earn your vote, and then deliver that plan. The election is about the future, and the choice is this. Who do you trust to secure your economic future? There are five parties, but two choices. Canada's Conservatives, or more of the same. Vote for a strong economy. Vote for Canada's recovery plan. Vote to secure the future. Vote Conservative. 
Who do you trust to act for your future? There are five parties, but two choices. The Conservatives, on the one hand, or more scandals, more spending and more debt, on the other. Vote for a strong economy. Vote for Canada's recovery plan. Vote for the future. Vote Conservative. Thank you Thank very, very much. Andrew Lawton, True North. You've been very vocal in pushing for transparency with regard to the uh, National Microbiology Lab uh, security leak. We've heard stories of Chinese infiltration of Canadian institutions, of influence campaigns against uh, politicians. How big a threat do you think uh, Chinese regime infiltration is? And if elected, what would you do to counter that? Justin Trudeau has been offside with respect to communist China for six years. And our citizens, the two Michaels, are approaching a thousand days in prison. It's been the Conservative Party that's been standing up, like Canadian governments of the past, for human rights, for our dignity, whether our motion with respect to the Uyghur minority population and the genocide, with respect to banning Huawei from our critical 5G infrastructure. Mr. Trudeau is completely offside with our values as a country and our allies. And the risks to our economy, to our public safety, are real. So Canadians need to know a Conservative government will never sacrifice your security, the well-being of our country, and our values at home and abroad. In September, you pledged to balance the budget within 10 years. More recently, we've heard projections from the parliamentary budget officer that we could be running deficits until 2070 for 50 years. Do you think that balancing in 10 years is still feasible? And if so, what would that course correction from an O'Toole government look like? It looks like Canada's recovery plan, our five point plan to secure the future. We will get the budget back to balance over the course of the next decade our fifth pillar, because our first pillar is going to get people working in all sectors of the economy and in all regions of the country. We're the only party that supports people getting back to work in the energy, the softwood lumber, steel, aluminum, our fabricators. We value small businesses and, ha and we'll have very detailed programs to help those in hospitality, tourism, hanging on by a thread. We will have the economy surging in the right direction for all Canadians, and that will allow us to balance the budget over the course of the next decade by helping people get back to work in all parts of this country. Simon Lefranc pour uh, le droit. Simon Lefranc, Le Droit. Mr. O'Toole, what's the Conservative Party's position on mandatory vaccinations for? Public health, for the public service. Thanks for the question. Vaccines are really important. Vaccines are safe and they work. I encourage all Canadians and all Quebecers to get a vaccine. My wife, Rebecca, and myself both had COVID-19, and that's the reason why we made our vaccines public. It's an important tool to fight against the fourth wave of COVID-19. I support strong measures such as wearing a mask and negative testing and rapid testing for those individuals who have not yet been vaccinated. These are reasonable measures to take. Justin Trudeau, once again, has been unclear. An election during the fourth wave is just another example of a failure. Vaccines are safe and secure for use. They're a critical tool in fighting COVID-19. That's why Conservatives have been pushing for a year to get a stable supply of vaccines early. That's why my wife and I, Rebecca and I, had COVID-19. And we know vaccines are critical, why we videoed our, our vaccination process. We must work together to fight COVID-19. And I support enhanced measures such as masking, showing a negative test, and rapid testing for those 
who are unvaccinated. Those are reasonable precautions that we can all use to fight together against COVID-19. Mr. Trudeau is launching an election in the fourth wave of a pandemic, not securing the health and economic well-being of Canadians after he let the Delta variant into this country. This is a time for us to work together for the well-being of all Canadians. Merci pour la réponse, mais par Thanks for à la the answer, but with respect to vaccinations and the federal public service, what's your position? Comme j'ai dit, les vaccins sont As I said, vaccines are safe and effective. I encourage all Canadians and Quebecers to get vaccinated. It's a useful tool in combination with masking and rapid testing. And Conservatives support Canadians in making their own choices. We need to educate, but not mandate. We need to work together to fight the fourth wave of COVID-19, and that's why we have a plan, the fourth pillar of our plan, to help our recovery. We want a better supply of vaccines and medical supplies. We need to be ready for the next pandemic. O'Toole, Hannah Thibodeau from CBC National News. Hope you're doing well. I, I want to ask you more on vaccines, please. Uh, when it comes to mandatory vaccines, uh, Tr Mr. Trudeau says it should be mandatory for federal workers, for people who are on planes or trains. You have said get your vaccine, but you don't believe in mandatory vaccines. He says this will be a part of the decision that Canadians will make on which party believes in this. But also, I want to ask you, sir, do you believe in a vaccine passport for people who have been vaccinated to have access to certain events or venues because they have gone out there to get their vaccines? Thank you, Hannah. As, as you know, my wife, Rebecca, and I publicized our vaccination process to show Canadians directly that vaccines are not only safe and effective, they're the critical tool in turning the page in COVID-19. We have to try and encourage and have as many people as vaccinated as possible and then take reasonable precautions to use other tools to keep all Canadians safe. As I said, using rapid testing, using screening, using masking, all of the tools that Canadians have learned to, to live with in the last 15 months, we have to, to use to fight COVID-19. And the federal government should respect and partner with any of the provinces on their approaches to keep Canadians safe as well. Some provinces will use a pax, passport, a vaccine passport, other provinces will use a a combination of measures to fight against the spread. I'm very disappointed, honestly, that Mr. Trudeau calling an election amidst a fourth wave of a pandemic is trying to confuse and divide people with respect to their health care decisions. Oh, Je vais toujours travailler en étroite collaboration I will avec always work in close collaboration with provinces to ensure everyone is safe. We need to work together, and I will always respect people's decisions. Quebec has chosen to have a vaccine passport, and across Canada, there are various tools. We need to work together. I'm really surprised at Mr. Trudeau's decision to call an election in the midst of a fourth election. It's disappointing. We need to educate and not mandate. There are tools to fight against the fourth wave. clear answer. Do you believe in vaccine passports yourself? And then just to clarify my first question, and then second, will all of your candidates be vaccinated? As I've said, and it's critical for Canadians to, to hear this, vaccines are safe and effective for use, and I encourage all Canadians to get vaccinated and to ask questions if they have any questions about the process. That's why I've been very public. My wife and I got vaccines and did it on video because we all have to work together. We also have to work to use the other tools that are there as well. And there can be reasonable accommodations using masking, using rapid testing, using screening, to make sure we keep people safe. It's time for us to work together, and I can assure you, the Conservative Party, all of our team members, all of our candidates, will be working hard to try and work with 
public health leaders to follow health advice and to keep Canadians safe amidst an election being caused, called for no reason other than political gain by Mr. Trudeau. He knows there's a fourth wave. He has all of the briefings. He has more information than all Canadians. And I sincerely hope Justin Trudeau is not putting people at risk by launching this election. Next question. Abigail Beeman, Global News. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, I'd like to ask you about the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory video on Twitter. I'm wondering how much of a setback it is for you to have a number of caucus members uh, criticize a party video on the eve of an election, and if unity is something you'll have to be working on in, in this campaign. Conservatives are united. We don't think we should be having an election in a fourth wave, but we do see the division caused by Mr. Trudeau, the flight of jobs, and investment in our country. Our country's never been so divided, and we're going to present a serious plan. Canada's recovery plan, our five-pillar plan to kickstart an economic recovery. Our team is united about getting Canada back to work and making sure we're never again unprepared for a crisis as we have been over the last 15 months. I'd also like to ask you, now that you have been a Conservative leader for a year and you talked about getting Canadians to know you better and there are still Canadians who, who don't know you very well, I'm wondering what you're going to do to change that in, in what's going to be a tight uh, time frame in this campaign. Well, I've been the COVID leader in a year, but I'm really proud of our team and I'm really proud of our efforts to connect with Canadians on Zoom and through all means and we'll be doing that later today. I'll be talking to thousands of Canadians later today as I have as leader of the opposition. Canada needs a plan. It's been a tough year for everyone, including my family, all Canadian families. Our five point Canada's recovery plan will address everything from jobs to accountability, trust in government, issues under Mr. Trudeau's cycle of scandals, national mental health leadership, an issue that's been important to me since I left the military, making sure we're ready and making sure we get our finances under control. I know that Canadians are worried about the future and as they get to know me, I bring people together, I deliver, and we have a plan to secure the future. I'd like to come back to my colleague from CBC's question. Are all your candidates vaccinated, Mr. We'll work very hard on the ground and will follow public health advice. As I said earlier, vaccines are very important. They're a critical tool in fighting COVID-19. And for our team, we'll be working very hard to respect public health advice. But that doesn't really answer my question. Moving on to our next question. Today, there is a Pride Parade, some leaders are present. When you became the leader of the Conservative Party, you said that you would be part of this type of event. What message are you sending, in your opinion, the fact that you're not there today? I'm getting ready for an election, but I also have a clear record on rights and on the LGBTQ community. I'm an ally, and I'll be working with the LGBTQ community on their well-being and on protecting their rights. And I will be part of Pride events in the future because as an MP, I've already been part of such events in my own writing. Mr. O'Toole, I'm a little confused here. You, you say that Justin Trudeau is putting people at risk by forcing us into an election campaign, and yet you won't require your own Okay, candidate. we are going to go now to Bloc leader Yves-Francois Blanchet. He is responding to the Prime Minister's announcement of an election call. Here he is at Bloc headquarters now. I called uh, the president of the... Acadia Society to send our best wishes. Please allow me also to express our solidarity with Haiti, who was once again hit by drama. And please allow me to express my sincere worry for the entire population, but mainly for Afghan women who are threatened under the Taliban rule. Yet again, 
a violent and sexist regime. That said, I also want to send you my best wishes for a stimulating election campaign to all candidates and to not only to those from the Bloc Québécois, but all political parties. Everyone who enrolls in the democratic process in these very troubled times. Our parliament should have lasted four years. That is the law that is in place, and we're starting to wonder if it will ever be respected. We are also in the midst of a very lengthy, protracted pandemic, making triggering an election irresponsible with motivations I've, tr I've tried to understand when they were explained by the Prime Minister, and I heard everything but the truth that is personal ambition. Despite this, let's ensure that the, the democratic process be festive. Thousands of political supporters will work, will volunteer for five weeks, not only to put forward the ideas of their leaders and their parties, but also for the joy of celebrating the democratic process and the kinship one feels when surrounded with other politically, politically minded individuals. Until very recently, the Prime Minister said that he didn't wish an election, that his sole goal was to protect the health of Canadians. And suddenly, he would have realized in August, two months after the last session, that Parliament became dysfunctional. That is odd and doubtful. And we find ourselves today in the current situation, and I believe the Prime Minister has had this intent for quite a while. I want to ask or rather answer a question that the Prime Minister has refused to answer thus far. Thus far. A party leader always requires courage. Not only does a political leader need to admit, but also needs to say very clearly what their intent is. Yesterday, the Liberal leader wrote on Twitter that the Liberals were the only party to support mandatory vaccinations for public servants, federal public servants. We can understand two things from this. Firstly, that the main issue of this campaign and mandatory vaccinations is not a public health issue, but rather an electoral issue. It's said very candidly, in fact, by the main leader in Quebec of the Liberal Party. But if the situation is so serious that we need to impose mandatory vaccinations, even though I'm the first to hope that everyone will get a vaccine if the issue is so important and if the threat is so significant that we need to impose mandatory vaccinations, then is it not too dangerous to go to the polls? It, is it not a contradiction on the part of the Liberal Party? It wouldn't be their first contradiction. In an electoral campaign that would followed a pandemic, in Canada and in Quebec, because uh, other, were in, uh, other places in the world, uh, things are very different. But in a normal campaign, we would have said, how will we help seniors, including those who are between 65 and 75 years of age, who were abandoned by Justin Trudeau's government? We could have talked about how we'll prevent another potential pandemic. Similar or different from this one, how will we 
ensure that pharma pharmaceutical research in Canada and Quebec is a healthy sector, more specifically in the area of vaccines. We could have talked about how we would protect the agricultural model in Quebec that has only been protected in the past two years by the Bloc Québécois. A supply management system. We could have talked about how we could reduce the use of petroleum products in Canada. The UN has clearly said that Canada's record is horrible. Canada is part of the problem, and regardless of what Justin Trudeau says, that's reality. And we need to remind Justin Trudeau that his government invested more in oil than the Conservatives ever did. We could have talked about how we could stop being on the wrong side of history when it comes to climate change. People who make empty statements and do the opposite of what they say by supporting the oil and gas sector in Western Canada. We could have talked about how, instead of supporting forestry in Quebec so that they could undertake a transformation, second, third transformation, a sustainable model, we could have talked about how we could support aluminum products in Quebec that were supported thanks to the Bloc Québécois. We could have talked about fisheries, about tourism, about Quebec's regions. We could have talked about the severe labor shortage, which is the first thing that is brought up by all municipal stakeholders and stakeholders throughout Quebec, but we're not talking about it. Why are we promising jobs rather than fostering support for businesses who need skilled workers? Why aren't we talking about improving productivity? And I have to say, in the electoral campaign, we should have, maybe we will, but we should have asked for accountability. We should have asked for those individuals that over the past two years made unfortunate comments about Quebec tried to get goodwill by calling Quebecers racist. We'll have to come back to this, but rather than speaking and talking about all those things, we'll be analyzing the daily new case counts, hospitalizations, and how many deaths? Every day, we'll ask which campaign will be the first to have a COVID-19 outbreak. We'll be focused on the day-to-day -day rather than looking to the future. This isn't an election about the end of the pandemic. This election is about a prime minister who refuses to abide by the 2019 mandate. The voters demanded at the time that he and the opposition parties negotiate and improve bills rather than do it alone. A prime minister who is looking for a majority Alors, government when Québécois Québecers have clearly demonstrated that they libérale. do not want a liberal majority in the House of Commons. There is even a risk with respect to the gains made by Quebec over the past two years in Mr. Trudeau's majority designs. What will happen of those improvements brought by 
the Bloc Québécois with respect to discoverability in streaming. What will happen to our talks with the UK or the US, where supply management has always been an issue? What will happen with the necessary transition in the oil and gas and the necessity to stop producing more carbon emissions, what will happen of the support we had managed to get for French-speaking nation in Quebec? What will happen, as we saw at the end of the session, of the improvements for French when Parliament Une personne probablement fort intéressante, mais qui n'avait pas parmi ses Just before the summer, la named appointed someone who, in a very Paris important Bottier capacity that has uh, undoubtedly an important and significant track record, but no ability to speak Qu French. What will happen of the law regarding secular services? Et dont le pouvoir what will happen of those transfers? Quebec required. Up into our seniors. The federal government does not seem to understand the support they require. At the end of the day, we'll never be able to circumvent one fundamental thing. The Bloc Québécois election campaign will always focus on Quebec's economy. Our campaign will always revolve around French. Our campaign will always revolve around equality between men and women and the ability to express one's thoughts. It will always be a campaign about freedom. Our campaign will always be about affirming who we are proudly, and we are the Bloc Québécois. Nous allons comme débuter la période de questions. Pour le fonctionnement, nous allons comme questions. We'll start with uh, the reporters who are here with us today and move on to virtual questions. One main question and one follow-up per reporter. Please use the microphone to, you, to ask your questions so that we can hear you. And we'll begin with Sébastien Desrosiers. Radio Canada. Bonjour, Thank you. Hello, Mr. Blanchet. So you said that it's irresponsible to trigger an election now. You've been focusing on that. Mr. Trudeau, when we asked him a little earlier, said that this was a historical point in time and that in 2019, Canadians in the election were not faced with a pandemic and they should now weigh in on how we should manage the situation for the coming four years. What do you answer to this? Should Canadians and Quebecers have their say? Firstly, I don't think Mr. Trudeau is trying to write a page of history, but rather, rather one of his own biography. Now, if Mr. Trudeau is looking at the polls, he'll see in these polls that Quebecers do not want an election because it's the middle of summer and because the pandemic is not yet over. And in fact, the future of this pandemic is uncertain. And because people have clearly seen that the par that Parliament was working, perhaps not in the way Mr. Trudeau wants, but his insistence will probably be negative in the end for him. Last week, Mr. Legault and Mr. Trudeau agreed on child care for Quebec, a new regime. Now, Liberals have said very clearly, and Conservatives, in fact, have said that they are looking to make gains in Quebec. Do you feel threatened as compared to your situation in 2019? Well, I'm certainly not terrified. Things are going well for the Bloc Québécois. And I'll say this. You will never see me 
tell the government of Quebec that it shouldn't get more money from Ottawa. It's a good thing. Quebec must improve its position to ensure that the government of Canada increases its transfers. And it's been the case, often. Now, seniors have not been supported sufficiently, neither has the transportation sector. And I think I would never begrudge the government of Quebec for looking for more money from the federal government. Now, do you think this balance would be the same without a large contingent of Bloc Québec, of Bloc Québécois MPs that uh, voice the concerns of Quebec in Ottawa, one must remember that perhaps Quebecers will send more Bloc MPs. Now, it's not up to me, but uh, the Bloc Québécois may make gains. Jean-Louis Bordelot, Le Devoir. Jean-Louis Bordelot, Le Devoir. Nous allons passer à la prochaine. Ah. Ah. Nous allons passer à la prochaine question. Question. Frédéric Lacroix. Frédéric Lacroix. Canadian. Canadian Press. Oui, bonjour. I'd like to know what the main thrust of your campaign will be. What main commitment will you take over the coming weeks? I would have liked the campaign to focus on something else than an ongoing pandemic, but uh, rather a pandemic that we would have emerged from. Now, some issues will come about, and campaigns are always fraught with surprises. But what I do wish... Given the billions of dollars spent by the government of Canada, I would have hoped that the government did not use the recovery money to support its election campaign. But I also hope that we make time for a conversation on tomorrow's economy so that we can move away from oil and gas, so that we stop spending over $6 billion a year over the past four years in oil and gas out west in order to focus on renewables where Canada and in fact Quebec has remarkable expertise to focus on forestry and on using our own expertise and resources on better supporting our research centers and businesses. I would like us to have a sustainable vision for Quebec's economy and in fact Canada can probably gain some inspiration from Quebec's economy. Follow Over the past few weeks, the, there's been some discontent in your party. Respect to how candidates were chosen, is that behind you? And how will you ensure that you emerge from that with All right, no and we're going to head over Look, now to NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. I'm going to sign off with you here in Ottawa. That's because I have to go get on the Liberal campaign bus. And uh, while we were listening to Mr. Blanchette there, I was taking, you can see there, a rapid test. Be glad you didn't have to watch it. Swabbing my nose and tonsils before I get on that. I'm going to hand over to our Mike LeCouture, who will be watching the rest of this special and taking you through it as the anchor. Have a great day. Mike, over to you and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. Take a moment to talk about what's going on in Afghanistan. It is very, very troubling what's going on. We're seeing the reality of Kabul falling and I'm really worried about the women particularly but the people that served with and helped out Canadian forces I'm deeply troubled we need to make sure we are doing everything possible to help out and to evacuate uh, those that are in danger now en general c'était un temps difficile Generally speaking, times have been tough, the pandemic has hit hard, and we know that Canadian workers have had to meet significant challenges. And during these tough times, we know that there were other 
crises. The climate crisis, we know that there are wildfires created by climate change and it impacts the whole of the country. There's a housing crisis. It was difficult before the pandemic, but it's worse now. And we also know that there aren't enough resources for health care, and this is something we've dealt with for a long time and is ongoing. When we think about the climate crisis, Justin Trudeau is the only leader of a G7 nation who has increased emissions over the six years he's been in power. And we know that the climate crisis is so devastating. We are feeling the impacts of it right now with forest fires across Canada, making it hard to breathe, making it hard to see the sky. This is a real challenge that we're up against, and it's only getting worse. We know that the housing crisis was a crisis before the pandemic. It's only gotten worse over these six years. It's becoming more and more unaffordable for people across the country to find a place that's in their budget to rent or to own. And we know that Indigenous people continue to face serious struggles, not having access to clean drinking water, being denied basic human rights. All these things have only gotten worse over the past six years. And despite things getting worse, we see Justin Trudeau right now focused on an election. We are still in a pandemic. We are still worried about this pandemic. And people have referred to the pandemic and said, well, we've all been in the same boat. And I say really clearly, we've not been in the same, we've not, we've not been in the same boat. We've been in the same storm for sure, but some people have ridden out this storm in luxury yachts while others have been in leaky lifeboats. We know that the ultra rich in this pandemic have been given a free ride by liberals and conservatives, so they have increased their wealth. The richest billionaires in Canada have increased their wealth by $75 billion in counting, and Justin Trudeau's allowed that to happen. Companies like Amazon make record profits, but still contribute virtually no taxes in Canada. Instead of calling an election, Justin Trudeau should be focused on these crises, on getting people the help they need, on walking the path instead of walking away from these commitments. So many people are wondering why this selfish summer election. Well, it's clear Justin Trudeau wants to grab power, wants a majority. But why does he want a majority? It's certainly not because he wants to help more people or help people more, it's only because he wants to help people less and people end up paying the price. The reality is he is fed up with New Democrats pushing him to deliver more help to more people and he certainly doesn't want to put in place any measures to make the ultra-rich pay their fair share. I believe that better is possible. Si on ose ensemble, je sais qu'on peut investir If we dare to together, I know that we can invest in our future. We can invest to improve housing. We can invest in our health care system. We can focus on indigenous issues. We can get justice if we dare to dream together. And that's what we want to do. Let's dare to together, let's invest in our people, and let's make sure that the rich pay their part so that we can build a better society together. I'm really honored to be here with you today, and I'm ready for any questions you might have. Thanks again to my entire team behind me, and I'm ready for your questions. Merci, Jagmeet. On va commencer avec les questions euh, sur l'endroit. On va passer à Jean-Sébastien Cloutier. Questions locally. Jean-Sébastien Cloutier, Bonjour, Monsieur Singh. Radio Canada. Bonjour. Vous avez Hello, certainement Mr. entendu Singh. le discours de Monsieur You've Trudeau. You've probably heard Monsieur Trudeau's speech. He said that we were et, et moving through a unique time, and it was time to ask Canadians what their designs are for Canada, what sort of recovery they want. Do you not agree with that? It's time to ask Canadians to weigh in? It's a good question. But if you look at what people have already said with respect to what they want, yeah, I'll wait. Les Canadiens et Canadiennes, les gens à travers le monde ont déjà dit qu'ils veulent s'assurer que les autres pays ne soient pas les mêmes. Est-ce que les gens ont entendu 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 les gens ont
Justin Trudeau listened to them, I could carry on. There are many examples of cases when people asked things and Justin Trudeau did not listen did not listen to their pleas. So the question is, why should people trust him now? Will he listen to them now when he ignored their demands for the past six years? Your platform is well understood. Some of your commitments are the same as two years ago. Mr. Boulris is the only MP or only a candidate who was elected last time. Did you learn from that? And how will you ensure that Quebecers change their mind about you? What will you say to Quebecers to ensure that they vote for the NDP rather than Liberals, even though if you look at the child care system, $10 a daycare, those are uh, significant issues and they've been piloted by the Liberals. The NDP never stops working to gain the trust of people. We never take anything for granted. We, the NDP, were those who pushed the government to deliver more help to people. I could mention that we now have a record. The Liberal par Party wanted Serb to only be $1,000. We ensured they doubled it, and more than 2 million Canadians received $2,000 through Serb. With uh, the wage subsidy, Justin Trudeau started with 10%. 10% was wholly inadequate to help people, and we forced the government to increase to 75%. By doing so, we saved millions of jobs. We've shown that with the NDP, you have people that are on your side, that are fighting for you and your families. And we've shown it concretely. And we also showed that op other opposition parties did nothing to improve people's lives at a time that was very difficult. The biggest challenge of an entire generation. We know that in the future, people will still need us. So if you vote for a new Democrat, you'll have somebody who's fighting for you and ensure that you and your families are supported. And it's more important than ever with the recovery. You need an ally who's defending you as a regular person. Olivia Stefanovich from CBC News. Hi, Mr. Singh. You've called this a selfish election, but I'm wondering what you would say to Canadians who do feel like they want to have a say in this post-pandemic recovery. And what is your vision? Why is your vision any different or stronger? I'll start with the vision. Uh, we, we know that the Canadians are worried about what happens next. It's a very genuine and real worry. People are up against a lot of challenges. They're worried about what happens next. And we've seen governments do one of two things coming out of an economic crisis. There is a clear playbook that previous Conservatives and Liberals have used, and that's either cutting the help that people need, which I'll remind folks Justin Trudeau is already doing right now. He is cutting, he has already cut the help that people who can't go back to re work receive by cutting the CRB by $800 a month. He's also clawing back the GIS from seniors who needed to access CERB. So he's already clawing back and cutting help to people who need it most. The other option is to put the burden back on the people that have already suffered or already struggled by increasing taxes on workers, on small businesses. We are the only party saying very clearly there is a third option, which is to make the ultra-rich pay their fair share. Companies like Amazon, which make record profits in this pandemic, do pay virtually no taxes in Canada. We can stop that. We can make sure they pay their fair share and invest that back in people. Everyday workers pay their fair share. So should wealthy corporations, so should the richest billionaires. Just because you're a billionaire shouldn't mean that you get to hide your wealth. And that's one of the things that we bring to the table, that we're going to make them pay their fair share and invest that into health care, into housing, into justice for Indigenous people. And um, in terms of people having their say, well, Justin Trudeau talks about people having their say. People have had their say. They've demanded very clearly that the ultra-rich should pay their fair share. Justin Trudeau teamed up with the, with the Conservatives to vote against our, our motion to make that happen. People made it really clear they want Pharmacare. 
Justin Trudeau teamed up with Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives to vote against a universal pharmacare that would help all Canadians. So Justin Trudeau has shown again and again, I can go on, that you know, people demanded clean drinking water. That's what people wanted in this, in this very important time. Again, he didn't listen to what people asked for. So what gives people any confidence? Right now, people are wondering, well, if he didn't listen to us when we asked for all these important things, why should we believe that he's going to deliver what we asked for now? If he wants to do what people are asking for, let's go back to Ottawa and do it. There's no reason why we can't. You're starting your campaign in Quebec, where your party has lost a lot of seats. You only have one seat right now in this province, and you also only have one seat in Atlantic Canada. So I'm wondering what your message is to voters in eastern Canada, and if you can't make any, any more growth or any more gains in the next election, what that says about your party's future in this part of the country. Well, I want folks to know when times were tough, we were in this pandemic and it was hard on a lot of people and, and workers were wondering and uncertain about what was going to happen next. We were there for them. We were there for people and we fought for you and your families. It was New Democrats that delivered the help that people needed and counted on. Millions of people kept their jobs because we were there to fight to increase the wage subsidy. We brought in a paid sick leave that never existed at the federal level. We made that happen and we stood up for people. And so everyone across Canada benefited from New Democrats being in Ottawa. And I say to folks, imagine how much more we could do with more New Democrats elected. The people that I met recently in Atlanta, Canada, would benefit from New Democrats fighting for them and their families to give them the help they need. We saw that in this pandemic, no other opposition party could point to a single victory that they fought for and won to make people's lives better. They did not benefit from having those other MPs representing them. New Democrats were there for them. And that, that's what I put to them, our track record and how another four years of Justin Trudeau saying a lot of great things but not delivering them is not going to help people. It's going to hurt people. And that we have the only plan that says that the ultra-rich should pay their fair share to invest in people. Prochaine question, Virginie Anne de la Presse canadienne. Question? Virginie, I'm curious to know, uh, here in Montreal press. yesterday, we saw thousands of protesters uh, taking down the street uh, against COVID-19 sanitary measure. Um, a lot of comments that were emerging was their mistrust towards politics, science, and the government. And I'm curious to see uh, what would you uh, say about your plan on rebuilding the trust with Quebecers and Canadians? I think it's so important that people have trust in the decisions we make. And so one of the most important things we can do is to give transparency, clear evidence, clear reasons why people need to follow public health measures. The more transparency, the more evidence, the more examples we can give of why it's important, I think is really, is really helpful. Uh, we actually have a great candidate, Nima Mashouf, who is a, uh, someone who's an expert in virology, who understands uh, diseases, who can help build that, that type of confidence. But I want to thank everyone who's taken the vaccine. It is so important that we follow these public health measures because we are all really connected. If we do everything possible to take care of each other, we will get past this pandemic and we can build a better Canada. But to do that, we need more transparency and clarity, more information shared. A lot of people have genuine questions and we can answer those and provide more information. And I'm confident Canadians, Quebecers, everyone wants to do their part. If we can provide them with that transparency, they will. And Annie Bergeron Oliver from CTV News. Hi, you talked in your opening remarks about how the situation in Afghanistan is troubling. Um, we're hearing that there may be thousands of Afghans with ties to Canada who believe that they're stranded, that they won't be able to get out. I'm wondering two things. One, what would you have done differently if you were leader during this crisis? And two, how are you going to make sure that this issue remains on the forefront to the top burner, despite the fact that we're in the middle of a campaign? Thank you. I really appreciate the question. First off, I wouldn't be calling an election. There are a number of crises that, that we're faced with right now. There's a, you know, the earthquake in Haiti where we need to be doing our part to help out. There's a, a really large Haitian population here in, in Montreal that's deeply concerned and worried about what's happening. And uh, in Afghanistan, this is a serious crisis. These are people that are at risk. Many of them are those that served with Canadian forces provided help and support, translation services. There are Canadian supporters, these are allies, that we need to be doing everything possible to help. So I wouldn't have called an election. I would be deploying all resources possible to get those uh, that are at risk out of Afghanistan, provide them with help to evacuate not only the people directly impacted, but their families as well. We've played a really important role around the world, and there's been many sacrifices made in Afghanistan, and a lot of people on the ground 
who need our help right now and, and I would focus on that. And how we can continue in this campaign is I'm going to raise this up, raise this issue and let Justin Trudeau know, uh, let uh, the government know that there is so much more that we can do right now and we should be doing to help these, these allies out. And you've also said that it's dangerous to be holding an election during a pandemic, but you did go and help Premier Horgan campaign in British Columbia in 2020. So what's different now? Well, a couple of things. Whenever an election is called, I will always be there to help out people and to show folks that there is there is uh, a strong option with New Democrats to fight for you. Uh, right now, what we're up against uh, with with Justin Trudeau calling this election is w what is the reason for it? You know, we've got two years left on our mandate, and it's clear that in calling this election, he's walking away from a lot of things that could be done. You know, today is pride. And there are a lot of things that we could continue to move forward on that Justin Trudeau promised that he would bring in. He promised that he would put an end to the blood ban. Well, he's walking away from that commitment because once we go to election, all the work towards that goal is, is going to be restarted. The conversion therapy ban that we wanted to push forward, more work needs to be done there. He's walking away from that. Really, it begs the question, why have this election right now if he wants to do the work that he claims he wants to do, we have shown again and again, if it's help for Canadians, we are there. And we've delivered that help. We have fought to get more help. But if it's to hurt Canadians, we've seen Justin Trudeau team up there in O'Toole to force the port workers here in Montreal back to work, to vote against Pharmacare, to vote against taxing the ultra-rich. So we've seen that Justin Trudeau can make this problem and work if it's to hurt people and we've been able to force him to help people. Why is he having this election when none of those things require an election? We will now go to questions on Zoom. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand function. Si vous avez une question, utilisez la fonction levez la main. That concludes our event. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Thanks so much for being here. Merci. Merci. And that was the leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh, here in Montreal. Thanks for joining us in this election special. I'm Michael Couture, taking over for Mercedes Stevenson, who had to jump on the Liberal uh, campaign bus, and that's why she is no longer in the host seat for right now. Uh, but Jagmeet Singh here complaining uh, that Justin Trudeau is having a selfish summer election, essentially saying it is completely unnecessary and dangerous in the middle of this fourth wave, uh, considering the Delta variant and what is happening as we're seeing cases uh, across the country continue to grow. Uh, Jagmeet Singh saying this is all about Justin Trudeau trying to gain his minority, sorry, to turn his minority into a majority government uh, and saying that, look, Parliament was working extremely well just now. Uh, Singh believes that the reason behind this is that Justin Trudeau is tired of the NDP uh, trying to get more out of the Liberals, pointing to the track record over the uh, pandemic and all of the negotiations that the NDP had with the Liberals to make sure that benefits were more, in the NDP's words. Um, and he basically said to the question that Justin Trudeau has posed, trying to put out there during his press conference, saying, well, maybe ask the other leaders why they think that uh, Canadians should not have a say. Uh, and the reason, Jagmeet Singh says, is because they did have a say two years ago uh, and the job isn't finished yet and that the Liberals did not follow through on all of the policies and all of the promises that they made back then. At this point, um, I think it's up to voters to decide and that is where we will leave it for right now. The campaign is officially launched 36 days from now. You will be heading to the votes to have your say on September the 20th. The leaders will be heading out across the country into your communities, talking to you in a variety of ways, virtual and of course in person. Our reporters will be out there as well, myself included, this first week with the NDP, but Mercedes Stevenson with the Liberals, Abigail Beeman with the Conservatives, and there will be uh, m reporting on all platforms. We invite you to continue following this campaign as we follow it with you, trying to ask these leaders why they should be the candidate of choice and why they should be leading this country and why they should be getting your vote vote, bringing your issues to them along the campaign trail. We invite you to follow us uh, on Global National, of course, on all of your local global stations, on Global News Radio, and of course, on globalnews.ca. Thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. We appreciate it, and we'll see you out there on the campaign.